Maine, they're like destroying all of the Norwegian, what are they, uh, borer beetles, a type of borer beetle in the tree. You mean the emerald ash borer? Yes, I think that's what it is. And they're, they're throttling like every Norwegian pine that we have in Maine. And they weren't there like three years ago, basically. Well, they were there three years ago, but they certainly weren't there maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Then if you, you look out on the landscape of the island or, you know, the hills, and you can just see these giant brown patches of trees and stuff, it's, it's quite amazing how fast they just decimate the population of certain trees. Got it. Well, j just for everybody tuning in right now, I got to run up and finish making red bean soup for my wife and I'll be back. But uh, just the one story I wanted to tell was uh, I'm harvesting all the mint seeds from uh, my mint right now. So the little like flower pods that have dried up and literally half of them have, you know, the little caterpillars like... <laughs> like inching out as i uh harvest them and i guess matthew would those be corn ear worms that also like mint pods or do you think it's a, I, I i need to take a picture of them but uh i was surprised to find a caterpillar and all the kind of flower heads of my uh mint but so there's a bunch mine. of different caterpillars that'll do that that'll like feed on the pollen or the seed pods or the flowers or or whatever could be the same one could be something totally different right so well I, i'm gonna throw it to you guys elka you're okay. seeing the conversation i'll be back in five minutes all right i'll try not to fall on my face <laughs> okay so I, i've got some notes here from the uh the information that you sent me online. So that's that if I get kind of sidetracked, I can always come back to that. All right. And it shouldn't be anything that you that, that should uh, throw you for a loop or anything because it's your information to start with. So if you read what you sent me, then this, this should be all right. I sure hope not. Yeah, I <laughs> okay. sure hope not. I don't want to throw any curveballs for myself. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for doing this. Uh, and we just met like a few weeks ago online. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Leal for uh, pointing me in your direction. Because uh, I'll, I'll tell the story. Is something weird showed up in my house. And it was like these little bugs protecting some eggs like an army. And it kind of freaked me out because I'd never seen anything like that before. So I like reached out on Instagram. It was like, does anybody know where to find xenthanol because i knew i looked that up and that didn't show up on instagram search so anyway but uh within 24 hours or actually less somebody had hooked me up with you you had answered the question and my wife loves you now so i know how to identify those stink bugs early on so i, I appreciate that and uh, and doing it so fast that's that's amazing this, this community is really something else i've never experienced anything like it actually I mean, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I'm also kind of, it's sort of surreal that anyone gets to be able to converse with so many people using something like social media. It has its own problems, of course, like any piece of technology can. But um, I'm happy because it, it uh, garnered the exact interaction that you're describing here with uh, people being connected, with me being able to give some information to somebody else who is needing it. And also, I get to make cool connections with people like yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's what it's yeah, all about, right? That's what it's all about, right? Oh, there's, oh, there's is there an echo, is there an echo on your end too? On your end too? No, it's probably because my microphone's too close to this speaker. We'll see okay. if it's better now. Okay. Yeah, I'll just ignore it. Yeah, just ignore all right. It. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, the reason, so, that, I the reason that I wanted to have this conversation, have this with, conversation you, with you. That is distracting that is having the distracting echo. Having <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can uh, change that for you. How's this? Maybe we can turn down the gain. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, well. <laughs> it's still there, but it's, it's, still a, little there, but it's a little lower. Okay. okay I'll just try I'll to turn the microphone. Okay. That seems to. Now, now you speak. Make sure that I can hear you. Uh, well, I'm going to turn off the microphone when you're speaking, so there's no echo. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm giving you chores already. <laughs> I, 
All right. Uh, the reason that I wanted to have this conversation with you is because uh, the cannab uh, cannabis community throughout the history has been known for solving problems sort of like this, uh, this HLV thing. It's like we've been uh, uh, posed many problems throughout the time, like the first generation is leaving us now and they solved a lot of the problems just with like uh, lights indoors and stuff like that and just uh, bugs and just figuring a lot of stuff out for the next generation. Uh, I guess I would fall into that. And uh, it's I think that the this generation's problem is going to be this kind of thing now that it's more open and things are getting passed around more freely and it's a there, there was a lot of diseases in the past, too, because everything was so clandestine and people weren't keeping clean environments. And it was just you threw it in a plastic bag and off it went and stuff like that. And it just things were things were different back then. So now that things are more uh, mainstream, you're having more mainstream problems. So I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. And it seems like you're really on it. And uh uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that paper that you you're getting published or not. Is would you like to t tell everybody about that? Because that's a, congratulations on that, by the way. That's that's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, how's my echo? Is there an echo, or is it just when? No, just when I'm hey, speaking. You know to what you. it is, Matthew. At one of these days, either you're going to invest in, or I'm going to send you some headphones. I have headphones. You, you do. Can you grab? Sure. Them? I mean, I guess so. I just didn't want to <laughs> disrupt the the meeting, the the conversation. Yeah, and no, I I'd rather <laughs> fix the uh, problem because because this has happened in the past when you've been on, and I think it's just that the the audio is coming through your speakers and going right back through your microphone. Oh well, it's trivial because my headphones are already connected. Excellent. Yes. Look at that. He's unstoppable. Okay. But okay. I, I, I think you need to pick those as the speaker source. Can you hear us through those headphones now? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. So, um, so yes, yeah, so this is not like a research report that I published. I just want to say that up front. Um, it's just a, it's a chapter in an agricultural book. The chapter is called uh, Viral Diseases of Hemp cannabis sativa. Um, and uh, the the book, uh, put on put on the spot, I'm forgetting the name, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, viral it's a viral diseases, with many other things. Oh, yes, viral diseases of horticultural crops. Is that that's correct? right? That right? That's okay. right. Yeah. Did I put that in the email? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. There so, we go. Uh, like I said, I tried to do my homework on this. I'm trying not to fall on my face and actually like get some good information and have a good conversation here. Not have a lot well, of one dead of us has to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you've already done years through the schooling and everything. It's, it's, I'm really excited to talk to you. So uh, is there a direction that you want to go at first or? Uh, no, not necessarily. Gonna... You just happened to mention the paper, so I just wanted okay. to mention yes. that, um, or the chapter, uh, that I was I had to condense a lot of information to a small, I had a, a writing limit, a word limit, so I had to be very um, creative with how I uh, structured and expressed things and prioritize some things over others. Um, but basically, I just wanted to say that I go over. Um, a few different viral entities, so viroids and viruses. Um, but I also wanted to say that um, I think one of my favorite references in that chapter that I make a mention of uh, is uh, reference number 19. I actually have the paper up right now called Zur um, uh, Virus Anfalangicht von Hampsorten. And my German is very rusty, but basically that means on the susceptibilities of hemp sorts or hemp varieties and in that paper uh, they go over uh, a few different other viruses that have been experimented now this paper that i'm referencing here is from 1997 so it's sort of recent um, but it um, <laughs> but it's been quite a while uh, they did some tests and they they experimentally transmitted several viruses that a lot of people don't talk about but some people some that people do talk about um, like alfalfa mosaic virus and cucumber mosaic virus and potato virus Y and a few others. And um, 
I just wanted to kind of open up with this idea that, like you said, um, probably a lot of these pathogens were already being experienced by people cultivating either recently, contemporarily, or also like millennia ago, potentially, depending on uh, a bunch of things, or even a few centuries ago. And that um, it is kind of only now that uh, we're able to, you know, sequence these viruses and take a look at what they are. And even this 1997 paper, I'm not saying that I'm, it would be wrong to say that it's, it's wrong or that it's dubious um, in validity, but uh, a lot has happened since the 90s with regards to our ability to like assess uh, viruses and their ability to transmit and how that happens. So I'm very uh, excited to see some of these problems get tackled kind of with a full on onslaught of um, cutting edge technology with regards to that. Uh, and I think Hoplite and Viroid will kind of be similar in that vein. We could start with that. I know a lot of people are curious about it. Okay. Uh, so I, I have something related to that that I'm, I'm curious about that I'd like to have answered. Uh, in that in those papers that you sent me, uh, there's there's a I'll just read what I have here. Gene silencing is what I want to talk about is uh, gene silencing and how plants use it as a defense against invasion and hide symptoms of their infection. Also, did I understand correctly that the viroids use it to function within the plant? Like, do they silence genes to be able to move around inside of there and replicate? And or did I misunderstand that? No, you understood it. Um, so uh, it's also kind of, uh, it's a very recent discovery, relatively speaking, when it comes to plant immunity, but also the immune, the immune response of animals and, and, and even like, you know, how viruses and viroids get around in, in their hosts. Um, RNAi, RNAi, RNA interference is one of these ways that that happens. And so um, a lot of, to really condense it, a lot of antiviral immune responses, essentially, in plants uh, make use of this because, uh, you know, viruses are kind of just, I mean, essentially, at the end of the day, they, they are these like kind of conglomerations of uh, genetic material. And so if you're able to disrupt that, um, you know, through silencing or through like deletion or breaking apart the functionality of these genes, um, you're kind of ahead of the game that way. And, and um, I don't think I could really talk about that in great detail, nor that I think it would be really helpful to do so potentially, but essentially speaking, you're right. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's not much more to say about that. I'm going to try not to ramble in this presentation. Okay. okay. Uh, so I'm, um, uh, cause that's kind of where I'm heading with a lot of my questioning is, is that, can we like screw with the structure of this thing in order to defeat it? Or is that what you just said seems like that that's not really a viable option for fighting this menace? Well, I think it would require, um, I mean, like the plant, like plants have various plants versus various viruses, right? Because this is great complexity that we're talking about here that I don't want to, I don't want to give credence to, or I don't want to not give credence to, but I also want to sort of uh, measure in, in how I talk about it. Basically, plants already have these capabilities to some extent. And a big part of it is also going to be the recognition by the immune system, the specific immune system of the individual plant uh, in, a, in a population, right? Uh, they're going to have different levels of response. That's going to be based on the plant's age. It's going to be based on the strain of the virus even. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity uh, with regards to that. I don't think that that will be the main way that we defeat hoplite and thyroid because you either have to breed for that um, capability and sort of augment it in that way, or you'd have to use some other sort of uh, methodology to do that. And the thing about resistances in plants is that pretty much every treatment and every resistance in reality causes sort of a selection pressure event, right? Um, there are examples where people have like, uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of research on aphids right now. Because I'm going to be making some videos about aphids and how they feed and and things like this, and basically, like is like there was a there's a um, a move to uh, create wheat that produced an alarm pheromone of aphids, and um, sorry about that. Oh, oh, <laughs> that is amazing. I can't believe this is happening right now. Uh, well, we'll see if you'll see what I'm talking about soon. That's 
really crazy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, a little there, serendipity uh, there. There's a little ant inside the lens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a small little ant that somehow found its way uh, into. Yep, there it is. You just saw yeah, it okay. cross past yeah. the lens. That's amazing. <laughs> I've seen it before in other electronics, but uh, I guess it's really fitting, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the, that's really funny. <laughs> but but uh, as I was saying, um, they put this alarm. They they basically uh, created a wheat strain that produced this alarm pheromone for aphids. And the problem with that is that um, uh, aphid reaction to the pheromone or to really any sort of odorant that's going to induce a response or behavioral response is plastic. Uh, it's flexible. It can change. And so they can become habituated to it. And other resistances are like that too. So it's not really effective to just go after one target. You got to, it's got to be multiplex or it's really a very feeble defense. And so it takes a lot of effort and work to like kind of make resistances be um, uh, kind of stalwart and effective for a long period of time. If, uh, and I think that's like kind of the problem here is that especially viruses because they replicate so quickly. Um, and they can produce so many different like mutated strains essentially because of that replication. They very quickly end up with a bunch of things that don't work and maybe a couple of things that maybe do work under the right conditions. And then those expand out. And uh, we're even seeing this with the B. top virus strains that are uh, infecting cannabis currently. Um, we're getting like the Warland strain and other strains from like beets and from like peppers and things like that. And it's no doubt because um, these crops are also and have been for centuries uh, affected by um, this virus, B. top virus. And so over many, 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 many generations, um, it's still a problem. And it can be in uh, native plants, too, without symptoms. Okay. Yeah, that uh, hiding of the symptoms thing that plants do, that makes this a lot more complicated and just in general. And uh, you brought up uh, replication a few seconds ago. Uh, maybe we should start with like kind of describing what these what this viroid looks like because I'm 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 fascinated by it because it's a single strand of RNA. It doesn't code, so that means it cannot create proteins. It's all it is is information. It's a strand of information, and if I understand correctly, it's just the shape of it that makes it different from another one, along with the information. Correct. Like that, it has to have a, a certain like uh, they were. They mentioned something about a hook or something. Like it's just a, a line of information, and then it has uh, the. I, I could be butchering this, but the, there's uh, there's a main structure and then there's the secondary structure, and without that secondary structure, it can't replicate. Is is that on track, or did I misunderstand what's going on there? And how? Like they uh, mentioned, uh, what's it called? Like uh, there's two families of these viroids, correct? And uh, uh, we're, conser right. we're concerned with the uh, Pospira viridae. Is that? Pospira viridae, yeah. That's yeah, right. that's what most of the of these things are in. And the, the other class is a lot of tree viruses. Is, is what I noticed. And uh, they described the way that they replicate as asymmetric rolling circle. Can you explain asymmetric rolling circle and describe to everybody, like kind of give a visual of what it is that we're talking about? Like give give the uh, invisible some visibility if you can. Yeah, I can describe it, but only, only rudimentarily. I'm not a, a virologist or anything like that, but essentially yeah. there's, there's like, so there's different so you mentioned shape, right? And and um, if I remember correctly, there are there are a couple of different um, like like for instance, a hot plate and viroid is a co, uh, cocadviroid. Um, so it's a specific genus of, of viroids, and it shares that with a bunch of other species. I think there's a citrus stunt viroid, or or something, or canker viroid, or something like that. Um, for those who are actually curious in the subject and don't want to just take my word for it, uh, you can look up the international um, the ICTV, the international something or other of, of viral taxonomy, ICVT. Yeah, um, I'm not giving the name very well here, but there's a, a large co international community that kind of tracks uh, viral, 
<clears throat> sorry, viral genomes and also viral uh, families. And you can see the taxonomy and the order to this. And uh, they do a really great job of having uh, references for kind of like the general physiological uh, facets that you're talking about. Because I think I might actually, if I go a little bit too far, if I get a little too detailed, I might misinform people. I'd really like to not do that. But essentially, you're right. There's like a circular kind of shape to how the, basically how the strain of RNA um, is formed. And there's other ones up, like that are kind of like a, a spiral or they're kind of like um, more sectional. And uh, this is kind of similar to how, like I, I'll mention another virus that infects cannabis, the Lesch chlorosis virus. That's a that's not even a viroid. That's a virus. It has a it's a, it's a protein shell, a capsid, and uh, it's got a bipartite and press. If I remember correctly, it might be a, also a tripartite genome. I, I might be wrong here, but basically, it's got what that means is it has different parts. And uh, um, crinoviruses like Lesch chlorosis virus aren't well known for uh, what's called uh, recombination or pseudo recombination. So one part of a genome can just kind of like, I'm oversimplifying it, but it can like fuse, it can, it can recombine with another uh, genome from a different um, uh, crinovirus, for example. And that's really salient because that really helps the variety. And so the really successful um, parts of the genome do well and the ones that don't perish essentially um, and there's even some evidence of that happening between species in the same genus uh, so yeah so essentially that structure is really important for being taken up into the cell to replicate and that kind of a thing and uh, it's especially useful because um, hoplite and viroid you know it's it's very much uh, uh, um, how do I say this it's, uh, it's transmitted really, really rapidly through like, as people know, like through wounds, right? So like when you, when you cut a stem, you're damaging a bunch of cells and tissues and things like that, causing a lot of mechanical damage. And some of that mechanical damage is going to um, kind of create a, a pathway for that viroid or that virus to like infect some of those cells that might be either partially damaged or not damaged yet, but they lack a bunch of the defenses that they would normally have. Um, from the plant. Okay. Well, Hopefully that, that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, the, that's the, like you said that you couldn't get into too much. You don't want to misinform people, and it's it's general. It's it's still general information and not well understood. I got that. For, uh, it's it was kind of frustrating in those papers. It's like what not what isn't known, you know. So and uh, on that note, it's like uh, how many universities are working on this right now that you know of. There's a... On hoplite and viroid? Yes. Uh, you know, I don't keep track of that with great detail, to okay. be honest. Uh, but I, I know that there are... an honest answer. Yeah, and I know that there's a lot of private entities that are like organizations and things like that that are doing that. Now, hoplite and viroid, um, obviously, you know, the name kind of shows you that it was uh, well known in hops first. And it was a major problem for people growing hops and cultivating it. And it continues to be. And, um, but like cultivation of cannabis is very different than cultivation of hops. So um, I'm not sure if the same kinds of techniques can be used to achieve the same objective. People didn't get rid of hops. What they did was they, um, they basically were very, very biosecure in how they um, produce their propagated material. And then they uh, kind of had a really good chain between, uh, like a lot of like industrial agriculture. Um, you know, you, you bring the, the clean stock to the location and you're very secure about how it's transported. And that's kind of like your main way of, of, of defeating the problem because um, it's not like, as far as we know, it's not really vectored by anything, an insect. Whereas like a virus like B. curly top virus or Lesch chlorosis virus, um, it is vectored. Both of those are vectored by different insects. And so you have a, a much bigger challenge, I think, from a biosecurity standpoint of uh, defeating viral uh, pathogens, as, at least in cannabis. Oh, but to answer your question, so like there are there are private organizations. Oh, I can hear the echo. Is it still there? 
No, sorry. I, I think we lost uh, Elka for a second, and uh, so I unmuted myself. But Car Car g give a long answer to his question until he cuts back. Sounds good. So basically, um, there are a bunch of different private organizations that are, of course, interested in making uh, you know advances in the genetic sequencing of viruses and viroids and pathogens of, of uh, cannabis in general. Um, and um, almost assuredly, there's probably some level of um, like public or university research going on too, because there's hemp programs and things like that. So I just don't really know to what extent um, in, uh, in, in great detail. But I'm, I think that there will be a lot more um, empirical research coming out in the next like half decade or so. All right, I'm... Uh... I, th I think his uh, his idea of being outside for this conversation. I two, see. More to the, two more to the rescue. Just some, chew up some time here. Right. So, Cheddar Bob, what what are we dealing with uh, on the rugged main coast? Uh, well, we just had a few days of rain, so we're gonna see how that kind of plays into the old PM and bud rot plans um um and uh currently i am dealing with a few mealy bugs uh just prior to to flowering so i'm trying to attack those with some bas uh, bavaria bassiana some em5 and I, i'm not really sure what else to throw at it matt do you have I'm a big advocate of Bouveria bassiana for a lot of different insects, and uh, mealybugs are really great for it because they're basically, um, you know, they're not totally sessile, but they just stay put with all that wax, and that's like their main defense. Um, the wax uh, lets them shed water and um, even like oils to some degree. Um, that's why a lot of people have to use surfactants to make like um, compounds stick really well, but Bouveria is living. And as long as you get the spores on contact, they're going to uh, penetrate the cuticle. But um, there are other like compounds like botanical insecticides uh, that you could utilize um, as well. Now, um, you know, on that topic, I recently uh, I, I had somebody contact me from Chile and I made a video about it, I think you're already aware of uh, root mealy bugs. And it was really great because um, although I'd seen them before, I wasn't able to really document them um, very well in that location. That was in North America. Uh, but uh, li like um, like Elka was saying earlier, you know, having this really quick person-to-person -person conversational ability allowed us to like interact and um, defeat even a small language barrier. Uh, also, my Spanish was good enough to speak, I guess, so, so I was understandable, which was great. But um, all of those things were possible, and uh, we were even able to communicate about treatments. Uh, they tried a hot water bath, actually, like 50 degrees Celsius, and they dunked the roots into the water. And uh, they killed the root mealybugs, and they said that they would um, check in with me about whether uh, it worked or not, because I was curious if the plants would get shocked. Right. And apparently, apparently they didn't get shocked, so... That was great. And, and I had heard about that uh, technique for root mealybugs uh, in general before, but I'd always been kind of wary about utilizing it for various plants because I don't want to be the person who has to explain why um, all these plants are now like heat shocked and, and dying because of um, something that kind of intuitively might seem like a, a bit aggressive of a move. Um, but I'm really happy that that worked out for them. And then a bunch of other people kind of chimed in and said that they had also come across root mealybugs especially in um, uh, uh, the Caribbean, for example, and um, other, many other places in North America. So it's great, too, because when you share something like that, other people can come in and confirm or deny whether or not they even had the same thing. And that's why, like, sort of sharing that observational footage is really important, pictures and videos and that sort of a thing. So I'm, I'm very uh, happy to facilitate that knowledge flow. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be quite a number that will be appreciative as well in the future, you know. 
Yeah, and, and then people who are even more uh, learned and uh, connected, uh, like in universities and things like that, can do some like really good and important studies. Um, and there's a lot of that going on already. Uh, maybe less so for like viruses, but I really don't know. Uh, but I think it's more often the case, especially that like, you know, m more macroscopic organisms like uh, insects and things get um, get looked at. Now, I have a question about about certain types of sprayers and foggers. Now, I use like a Chapin, um, you, the, the infamous red Chapin sprayer as for a foiler. But I'm I'm looking into getting using a fogger because of the the microbead size, right? Now my, I've been curious about with these mealy bugs. I find them a lot more inside that brand new little meristem, new growth, that tight little node that you can't really pull apart and and get your fingers in there to kill them and squish them. So which I mean, which one do you think is going to get inside of that little area better? Like a full drench of the chapin or that fogging that like real big dispersal of the, the micro beads from the from a fogger with like a Bassiana bavaria or another type of something or other? I feel like um, if you were working with uh, some sort of a chemical compound, I might go with the fogger potentially. I think both would be uh, possible though. If you were using a biological though, I think I'd go more towards the drench. I feel like that's a more, um, or like some sort of a more traditional spray. Okay. And, th and that's because maybe just you're not damaging the, the whatever living microbes or entities that would be in the water from forcing them into such a small small area is that kind of what we're yeah like um i mean uh i had worked with some ornamental horticulturalists uh who were dealing with me various mealybugs like citrus mealybug and long-tailed mealybug in roses and they had a similar sort of problem uh but their plants even had thorns yeah. and um and so uh we experimented with um uh, pulse fogger and um, auto fogger and um, also biofogger. So these are basically like jet, uh, not really a jet engine, but very very hot um, uh, comparison tubes. Of, yeah, yeah. And but but of course to use the bios, we had to use the bio uh, fogger, and it was a little bit it was a lot more expensive, but it was it was a lot better at like you know keeping the temperature and keeping the um, the volatility in a way that would be conducive to the life form and I just and although your system doesn't use something like that um I do feel like or, or does it are we talking about a similar system I I'm sorry I, I lost you for just a second which which system oh sorry the fogger system uh is it is it like uh does it use like um immense heat to operate or is it um so I, I feel like it's not like that right yeah, I currently don't use a fogger, but I've been looking into like one of those Petra foggers or something yeah. like that. Um, just because I was, my thought process was smaller beads will be able to penetrate smaller, tighter areas better. But I didn't even really think about that possible, you know, damaging the, the, the actual life in what you're spraying. So yeah at least in, at least in those contexts um I, I would just say get a system that is that is specifically meant to use um biological agents like um bacillus and uh, buvaria and that kind of a thing and i think yeah. you'd be set but you're but you're right um there, like like it is true like um you know when you atomize it and you spread it that way it does get everywhere in a, a much more fine granularity and that has a real and uh true benefit and value but um it I think that both techniques can achieve good effectiveness. Excellent. Well, now that we have the regularly scheduled guest and uh, host on, um, I will get my ugly mug off here and let you two continue with your uh, with your chat. Uh, uh, thanks for holding it down, man. Yeah, I do what I can. All right. I, I, 
I forgot where we were, but uh, on what you all were talking about, uh, someone suggests I have uh, Japanese beetle problems like you wouldn't believe here. And uh, someone suggested the last time that I was on, I was bitching about those. And somebody suggested to me to use nematodes. And what would, uh, on the vein that you all were just uh, talking about, you may have just answered it to this for him. But what would be the best way to spread those around, like you were saying, evenly without killing little buggers? Oh, the nematodes. Yes. That, that, and were, were they correct about that, how the nematodes will get in there and eat the larvae over the, the uh, cool season? And it really does a number on them is what they were. And I looked into it, obviously, after they mentioned it. And I said, but you, uh, reliable sources on biology like that is kind of iffy. You know, I'm not asking you that. I don't want you to do a commercial for anybody. But uh, I was just uh, the spraying aspect is what and you probably just answered it for him. But I, I wasn't here. So could, could you? Absolutely. No, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, and, I, and I appreciate you framing it the way that you do. Um, I try to keep an open mind and I try to, but I also try to like, I guess, like account for the fact that, um, you know, organizations that produce products and services are um, kind of definitionally, they can have some level of corruption or some level of incentive to maybe not give you all of the information. Um, I'm not saying that people are all duplicitous or anything like this, but um, you know, it's just it's just it's a uh, it's a factor to consider always. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, um, nematodes are there are several nematodes that are really great for uh, uh, scarab beetles in general, your Japanese beetles and things like that. Uh, that are kind of subterranean, and um, uh, I think probably the most uh, salient thing to say is that if you're using like a drench sprayer or something to drench spray nematodes, uh, you know, you should really pay attention to how that um, like the spray nozzle or handle is constructed and whether or not there's a fine um, mesh screen <laughs> between the, uh, the opening of the tube and the exit holes. Because um, on a number of occasions, I've had people utilize uh, nematodes that come to me and say that they use nematodes uh, and it didn't work. And um, uh, more than more than a few times, it's because they just simply didn't check their their spray guns, their spray nozzles, for example. So like small little details like that are important to consider. But what happens is those nematodes get in the soil or the substrate um, and they, uh, they penetrate the, um, the insect and then they reproduce in it, essentially. Bacteria in their bodies are what actually kill them, typically, uh, not the nematodes themselves. And also, um, generally speaking, the larger the host is, um, of course, like kind of the more biomass of nematodes you get, like you convert basically the larva into nematodes. Um, and then those like infection, those like uh, um, predatory juveniles kind of like uh, they leave and they kind of try to find chemically through sensing in the soil um, signs of their hosts and they'll go and, and uh, colonize those. And that's how the cycle continues. But if there isn't any hosts afterwards that they can get to, then the population kind of perishes locally. So you have to reapply. Okay. Uh, so I wish that my municipality would just put that in, in the uh, spray trucks instead of glyphosate, you know, <laughs> so just spray that <laughs> shit around. <laughs> that would be helpful. But OK, well, let's get back on topic. Like I said, I don't know where exactly we were. I think we were talking about reproduction or maybe we were past that. Uh, we were talking about um, uh, sort of esoteric viral um, recombination and things like that. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I guess like to talk a little bit more about viruses, um, I guess I just wanted to say that there's a few different viruses that people should be aware of. Um, obviously, many people are aware of the hot plate and viroid, um, but there's also the beet curlitop virus, which is um, showing more and more prominence in North America and other parts of the world for cannabis. But uh, it's known globally already as a, as a major pest. It costs like many millions of dollars in damage every year. Alleged sclerosis virus is also similar in that way. So the beet curlitop virus is vectored by what's called the beet leafhopper. And the way that you, and the way that you control for the virus is that you prevent the vector, um, most primarily, not by like making a viral resistant plant, but by shutting off and disrupting 
the ability for various life stages of the vector to get into your area and then make contact with your plant. Because they only—that's where to a feed. guy like you comes in. That's, that's right. That's, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just I had no. to get that out there. It's like that. I, I've noticed that from uh, the the literature that you sent is like this is why you're interested in this is because you you can play a part and guys like you the, it, there's not a lot of like 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 you especially interested in cannabis but it's like uh, I should have asked you this earlier like what got you into like how did you get into bugs like were you like a kid going around with the field guide and like picking up butterflies and like identifying them and stuff like that or is this like a later in life kind of thing or this uh, i'm sorry to backtrack and interrupt you but no, it's okay. it's, i'm curious about this because i'm curious about you as much as i am about these bugs and the and the viroid and viruses and stuff like that so uh, sorry <laughs> no, no 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 reason to be sorry um basically i was always kind of a naturalist as a kid and, uh, you know, I was hiking a lot. I was in the Boy Scouts. Um, I played a lot of Pokemon as a kid. Um, and uh, I always say this, uh, basically, so it's kind of like ingrained in my, in my head as a response. But, but um, uh, there's a lot of aspects of my childhood that kind of facilitated what was already a, like kind of a, I think, like a, uh, an interest in like uh, plants and, and especially insects. Um, uh, specifically. And so that became an, uh, an appreciation for ecology and the environment. And as I like hiked various places in the Boy Scouts and I, um, uh, you know, uh, did ruck marches and things uh, working with um, the army, although I never commissioned myself, I did go to a lot of cool places and, uh, and do a little bit of training here and there. And uh, kind of all throughout the, that, those environments, I um, kind of I always kept that appreciation. And I do like to say that as, as a child, um, I did feel like uh, various video games kind of helped facilitate that appreciation because um, like the creator of Pokemon actually uh, was a bug catcher. Um, people who are familiar with the series knows that a lot of times you start the various games off playing against people who catch bugs and uh, indeed like the creator of Pokemon was also this person who was like running around in caves and in rivers like catching insects and like taking a look at them and that sort of thing and I, I think that's kind of neat to sort of share that with the creator of a franchise that was a, a childhood favorite um, and I think that it also speaks to another thing that I'm kind of passionate about which is the um, the potential for like media, but specifically things like video games to like educate and teach people things without them even having to like read a textbook or something like this. And I think that it's really cool that um, I feel like that was a synergistic thing. And now you have somebody like me who's, um, you know, who likes to think themselves learned and uh, at the very least tries to help out people a lot uh, with all these sort of uh, organisms that people don't know a whole lot about. And so I feel like sometimes, some days I feel like a real Professor Oak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's really cool. I, I'm a big Nintendo fan too. And Miyamoto was, was something else. I don't know if he had anything to do with uh, Pokemon or not, but uh, he had a lot to do with Nintendo. And uh, The Legend of Zelda, you were talking about how the video games can teach you things. And The Legend of Zelda is a lot like that. It's, it's, quite, it's kind of a morality tale. It's the same one every time too. There's, there's a dozens of games but it's really the same game over and over and over again teaching you the same same lessons so it's it's yeah it's good it's good that they're they're getting in the young minds that way in a positive way you know so that it, it influenced you to become the wonderful man you are today so i appreciate uh, but, that compliment uh before i rudely interrupted you you were talking about the other uh viruses from other plants that are affecting cannabis is is that a problem with viroids too do the viroids jump around like that from species to species uh i think that viroids tend to be kind of um more host specific if I'm yeah, like hop correctly. and cannabis being kind of cousins so that they're susceptible to it yeah like but, um actually like for example i'm on the ictv um, website right now. Now, to give you guys the name, this is the International Committee. That was the word I was um, not remembering right. On taxonomy of viruses, the ICTV. And if I just look here, hop latent. So 
sorry for the typing. Um, yeah, we can go down here to Cocadveroids. And uh, yeah, so I have a list here. We have Hoplate and Viroid, which is a Cocadveroid, but we also have Coconut, uh, Tinangaja, hopefully that's what's pronounced, a uh, Viroid. Uh, a coconut kadang kadang viroid and citrus bark cracking viroid. That was the one I was trying to remember earlier. Um, so all these viroids are in the cocadveroid genus. So they're they're more closely related to each other than like other species in different genera. And um, I think that it is the case that they're generally speaking kind of um, uh, more host specific. Whereas other viruses like B. curlytop viruses, it's incredibly incredibly um, uh, prolific. And uh, there's hundreds of different plants that are infected by BCTV and its various strains. And it's really, really good at um, becoming uh, uh, get, uh, becoming very adapted to specific plants. So we, we tend to, at this point, kind of organize different strains by what they infect better, but that's still kind of like a, a proxy. Okay. Uh, so what would be what do you think is going to be the way that this thing does get defeated eventually because right now it's just kind of running rampant and everybody's scared of it and it's like what the thing that i'm interested in is like i'm i'm a nobody i'm not running a huge commercial grow or anything but the seeds i care about the seeds so and it, they're saying that that there it's been shown that it's traveling in seeds but they're not they're not saying like at what rate yet because it's a there's as we keep saying, there's a lot unknown about this, and that's what's scaring the shit out of everybody. So uh, uh, what, your, what is your guess? Like uh, you mentioned earlier, like uh, contro controlling the vectors from one host to the next, but like what, what else do you think is going to be a viable defense against this thing? I'm actually, I'm actually sort of, um, you know, dubious about a, a movement forward as well. I actually... I actually spend uh, quite a bit of the introduction of the chapter that I was talking about um, on, or actually the, the sort of the introduction, but also the conclusion about uh, sort of viral mitigation in cannabis, because without, so without competent biosecurity measures and sort of a, a whole community effort, both at the supplier level with nurseries and things like that, but also, and distributors, but also at the like local level, People need to be biosecure. People need to understand integrated pest management and techniques like that. And they got to understand the symptoms of pests and, and that sort of a thing. Uh, with, without that, uh, I think it'd be very difficult to have like a really good um, control for hoplite and viroid and also other viruses for that matter. Um, and there's a legitimate, I would say, and that's what I articulated in the, in the chapter, there's a legitimate... Um, uh, disincentivization in trusting organizations of authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in <You> general. <laughs> in general, yeah. <laughs> uh, but specifically in the cannabis space, right? Uh, yeah. Historically. So um, unlike, for example, in tomatoes or roses or whatever, um, that's a really big hurdle. And I don't think that this is getting easier. I don't want to speak for the entire community. I can't speak for the entire community, but I do feel like that's a pretty um, pervasive vein <laughs> of um, of perspective. And um, until there's well, like a reason, it was well earned. It was well earned. And until <laughs> it's an, until there's like a reason, a really good reason for people to trust that that's going to be that's going to continue to be the case. I think people are going to be naturally and understandably kind of reticent um, to like sort of trust organizations to like maybe take their genetic material even or to um, uh, produce or provide um, the right legislature legislation even to like uh, protect people at various degrees um, in the commercial space, for example. Um, or even uh, produce cultivars that are either resistant or free of the um, pathogen, uh, because we even have problems with that too. So uh, I'm not saying that it'll never get better, um, but it, a lot of things have to change. And also I'm, I'm very, um, 
I'm very actually kind of uh, worried and nervous about the potentiality for um, some of these pathogens to move back to um, areas of, of, of origin or at the very least um, sort of land race populations in places that are not um, cultivated or, or they're not extensively uh, cultivated because that can cause a significant problem for um, uh, germplasm or gene stock. And um, if we ruin a lot of these like, you know, um, more or less feral populations that we want to like um, harvest and, and cultivate and protect, um, then uh, we gotta be a lot more um, focused about that kind of a thing. And I just don't feel like that coordination is here and it might not be here for a few years or more in the most ideal uh, sort of context. Yeah, and uh, those land races that you mentioned are, are already under enough pressure as it is. They don't need something else coming in. And it's, it's, it's been mostly human pressure over the, it's It's amazing some of them are still around, like the Indian Land Race Exchange guy. It's amazing what he's out there doing is collecting all of that stuff. And yeah, I, I hope he's successful. It would, uh, you can see what direction he's going in. But uh, uh, what, what else did you bring up there that... Uh, I wanted to just, I just wanted to point out also that like, um, you know, a military tech buff that I pretend to be, um, uh, you know, those, that area of the world is also very hotly contested for a number of um, uh, geopolitical reasons. So even if we were to get some level of competency in, um, in, in fighting the pathogen, we might lose those territories or they're already very difficult to access already. And, and um, I bring that up because uh, in the look for like um, natural enemies to uh, cannabis pests, like the cannabis aphid, for example, um, I've come across research like with um, parasitoid wasps, like aphidius uh, matricarii, which I talk about in my cannabis aphid pest primer video on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. And, um, uh, that parasitoid was found in um, the Kashmir Valley, uh, parasitizing cannabis aphids. That's like one of the only examples that I was able to find in um, in the literature about it. And uh, to me, that's very um, concerning because that place is currently very, um, very, very, very contested. And I don't expect that to um, deflate soon. Yeah. So we could be shutting ourselves off from natural um, biocontrol agents for us to use as well. So it's really very kind of unfortunate from that angle. Uh, that's a tough wasp too, because that's a very cold area up there. Uh, Kashmir is uh, that's northern India, but it's like up near China, correct? That's that's very. That's right. Uh, that, that, I'm, I'm imagining that's who's who's contesting the area. I, I don't uh, yeah. want to get into a geopolitical yeah. conversation, but the... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Those are those. That's, that's at least two of the over entities. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a, back to the toughness of that wasp. That, that's really amazing. That that and it it uh, developed up there, obviously, to go after that aphid. And yeah, we losing something like that. That's way too beneficial. As that brings up something that I've have in my notes here about how insects is like this is one of the most fascinating things that you sent me is uh immune memory in insects all right oh yeah yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, absolutely amazing it's like magic it's okay i'm gonna explain but this is my note here immune memory or immune priming infection creating protection against future infection from the same pathogen not only for the individual, but also into further generations. Can you expand more on that? Because that's just, that, like I said, that's magical. And it happens so fast. So as you imagine that bug, we were that in, uh, wasp we were just discussing, like it was able to develop that uh, taste for the cannabis aphid pretty quickly, I would imagine for, as, I know that's a different thing, but uh, similar to that. Yeah, you know, so I'm sorry to ramble on, but uh, can you explain that to us a little better? Because it's fascinating. Yeah, so um, actually you touched on a really great point and something I was going to say all, kind of already. So I'm glad that you touched on like co-evolution, essentially. I'm um, getting a taste for the host in the, in the first place because um, basically cannabis, to the best of the research that I've been able to locate, and um, 
cannabis and humulus, we talked about hops, right? Those are sister species. And there were probably other species, maybe, I mean, there probably were other species of cannabis during its speciation event, where it split from the cannabis that we know about and uh, humulus that we know about. And so they had a common ancestor like 19 to 27 million years ago, which is relatively um, recent. Um, and so I bring it up because when plants speciate, our understanding is that, um, you know, it's, it's theoretical, right? We, we've done uh, genetic analyses of aphids and other, other plant pests, and we very, ecologists have studied like how these interactions come to be and looking at like uh, sort of like deep evolutionary uh, ramifications and, and, and genetic aspects of that and that kind of a thing. And um, basically, the cannabis aphids are specialists of cannabis, um, for about forward on cannabis, but there's also a forward on humuli and it hosts uh, switches between cannabis and uh, prunus species like your plums and, and things like that. And um, interestingly, the cannabis aphid doesn't do that. So perhaps it, perhaps its ancestors used to do something like that. And then that behavior attenuated. We don't really know. Um, but that par but that parasitoid, most aphids sort of specialize uh, as they co-evolve with their hosts. And parasitoid wasps are the same way. That interaction has probably been happening for about as long as cannabis has been around. So it's been that way for a while. And... Um, they get the ability to detect those aphids by setting visual cues, factory cues, and things like that. And they're able to locate their, their target. But like you say, uh, the Casimir Valley is, is pretty, um, it does get pretty cold. And it is a, a pretty, um, uh, well, it's, it's a very active environment. And um, they probably rely very heavily on, I mean, they, they, I think they also colonize other aphids as well. So I think they're a little bit more generalist but um, they have to overwinter. They have to like have a host and they have to be able to exist in that host. They probably overwinter. This is just totally speculation. I haven't looked into it, but um, uh, since there's only a couple of uh, forms that you can consider for that wasp, uh, it probably overwinters in the cannabis host. So, or in the cannabis aphid host rather, uh, when it injects the egg, the larva develops in the body and um, you know, if it's like spring or summer, perhaps, then it like goes on its merry way and, and it closes and does its thing. But I'm sure that if it's colder, that's probably where it's overwintering and it's probably a long process and they probably eke out an existence until it's warm enough and then they come out again. And so like, when you think about it, that's a very fragile uh, and, and sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of a difficult, uh, precarious place to be, you know? Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's what's amazing to me with uh, insects is how fast everything is. And that's why I touched on that immune memory thing is because of how quickly like that's just one one infection. And that right. uh, insect can pass that on to its future generations. And it's just that's that's imagine if we had that type of ability, there wouldn't be a big vaccine fight right now. That's for damn well, sure. We do. Um, so, so not that fast though, or, or do we, Oh like yeah. We, well, we pass it on to generations and, and like all of that. Well, for, yeah, well, for a long time, well, stress, stressors, various stressors can do that. Um, uh, and you know, I am embarrassed that I totally over the glossed over that really important part that you were talking about the actual immune response. So I apologize for that. Um, I told myself I wouldn't ramble, but, um, base, but basically, <laughs> it's a good ramble. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the immune response uh, that you're talking about actually for a long time was either it was suspected, but wasn't really uh, verified. But, it, but um, insects do have sort of an adaptive immune response like, like other animals do, like humans do. Um, and, but you're right. One of the, so one of the things that makes a lot of insects really successful ecologically, because over 90% of animals are insects. Um, or other arthropods for that matter. And so the reason why they become so successful is because they have very short lifespans and they, um, they eat many different things and um, they rapidly reproduce, right? And so you get kind of the same advantages that like the viruses we were talking about have, which they replicate 
you know, even gr at greater magnitudes, uh, which allow them to essentially, you know, if you're going to have like a, a selection pressure kind of divert that that line one way or another, if you're going to have something, some sort of combination of genes that confers a trait that becomes useful, then that's going to get, um, you know, copied and printed, uh, you know, way quicker. But insects also make use of this really rapid development that you're kind of uh, sort of talking about and alluding to. And this immune response, um, you know, that goes from like a parent to offspring. Um, there's some really cool examples of that with um, uh, with parasitoids of like caterpillars. So, a uh, various parasitoid wasps utilize um, special viruses, in fact, poly DNA viruses, to uh, attenuate the immune system in caterpillars. Um, so when they insert the egg. And I posted this on Instagram before for those who are curious, um, and I might make another post about it if people are interested or a video. But basically, uh, various like ichneumon wasps and brachinoid wasps, um, they have co-evolved with viruses to uh, basically shut off the immune system or, or, or um, kind of really, dis really uh, disrupt it. And then on the same token, certain caterpillars, for example, or other insects have... Um, basically been able to do the same thing for themselves to fight it's like bio warfare you know they they in fact use the same uh, methods to attenuate the attenuation and so you have this sort of climbing arms race um it's really very fascinating to me yeah. um, as far as stress response is concerned you know um i've read some uh some research that looks at um, kind of stresses through human generations and there are people who have been victims of trauma or have existed in very traumatic um, environments and contexts that have you know we've been able to show we've been able to like test like the like to take blood tests and do sequences of like grandparents and parents and then children of those of that line of people and 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 we can see the upregulation of certain genes that are associated with stress response and in some cases it causes some very like some very um life altering changes um uh, some people become more susceptible to certain illnesses or they become more um susceptible to certain uh maybe in some cases behavioral disorders it's just um just one of the examples of things people become sometimes hyper vigilant um it just depends i mean i mean and that's just from like a genetic perspective that's not even entering the fact that maybe a lot of people who are in traumatic contexts also don't um leave them and so that like predisposition that like genetic predisposition uh gets combined with a with a real environmental um force and so that but that's why the predisposition is helpful, right? Because then that becomes an e it's easier to like have those stress responses occur. Um, not really I always ideal for human life, though. And so finding ways to attenuate that for people um, uh, is a is an important medical, um, I guess you could say, a journey. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. You, you just made a good case for nurture over nature. It seems it's really that's both. Yeah. Okay, that's a, that. That was that was a really good answer. Thank you. That's. Uh, yeah. Sorry another, for throwing you a curveball like that. Kind of. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. This is very cool. Uh, talk to us about these other bugs that you're seeing uh, messing with cannabis. Uh, the moths, the corn ear wormer, or the corn ear worm, the hemp borer. Uh, flea beetles, and uh, you also mentioned something called, called sclerotinia. Did I, is, oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about there is, yeah. What, what's what's up with these little buggers? What these these problematic things? Yeah, so sclerotinia is a uh, fungus that infects. Uh, I, f I find that it often infects like the stems of a lot of various plants, and I've seen it uh, more recently in cannabis. That's why I sent you the um, uh, that as an example. Um, and uh, yeah, that's right, sclerotinia, very good. Um, so we, um, I kind of, like you said, as we grow, as we cultivate more often, we're gonna come across pathogens more commonly, whether they come from other crops or whether they were already a, a pathogen of cannabis is 
not irrelevant, but maybe functionally irrelevant for a lot of cultivators. It's really just a question of what is it, where is it, how can I stop it, um, how can I prevent it, and how can I cure it. And um, so some of the so scler sclerotinia is a sort of a pathogen that infects systemically the the tissues of like stems and um, really causes a, a, a major vascular infection that's pretty hard to get rid of. Um, in my experience, I don't know of any way to really control it that uh, doesn't kind of make use of some like noxious sort of fungicidal agents or possibly even botanical um, fungicidal agents and things like that because of the way that it infects. Um, even if you give a plant uh, a great amount of nutrient and you, you put it in an environment where uh, it's going to photosynthesize really well and that sort of a thing, the, the sort of necrotrophic nature of sclerotinia is that it like will basically melt uh, and digest the, uh, the plant cells um, in that infection. So it's kind of like it, it totally, um, it totally uh, bypasses uh, the immune system, the cellular responses and that sort of a thing of, a, of, a, of the plant because it just destroys it and then sops up the nutrients afterwards. Um, there's other fungi that are like that. Whereas other things like the powdery mildew that Peter mentioned is more of a biotroph. And so it actually has to have, it's obligate to. So it has to kind of play nice with the physiology of the plant to siphon resources through its hostorium. And um, that's why it's a lot less of a, of a problem in some instances. It's a lot less lethal because it's a good parasite uh, in that way. Yeah, so I just have to put up with it. So I, have, I have plants that you, they just, it just gets it, and there's nothing you can do about it. And I can't even get rid of the plants. You dig up the roots, and they're still there. It's a, a bee balm, so it's a mint. And it's, mm. like, <laughs> it's, it's tough to get rid of once you've got it around. It's beautiful, and it, it smells like Fruit Loops. But the uh, powdery mildew, is, I just use it now because I know it's going to be there. So if I, uh, a lot of people don't believe in this method, and it may be bro science or whatever but if i've got a plant that i want to see if it's going to get powdery mildew i put it right next to that bee balm and see if it's going to spread from there to because you can see that it does get on other plants that uh it's a little bit more susceptible to it but not as much as it it doesn't just hog it all up you know what i mean it kind of spreads spreads around but i i've been told before that 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 method really isn't uh the best way to test a plant for powdery mildew but it's just a, I only have so much to my available to me to use. So that's anyway, that's get off on a tangent right there. But as yeah, the powdery mildew is uh, kind of, I'm assuming those are your plants, Peter. Yeah, Indeed. That's pretty bad. <laughs> that's, it's ugly. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I just want to, I want to, I want to just uh, sort of assuage your concern here. Um, it is and it isn't. So on the one hand, like we should acknowledge that there are many different kinds of powdery mildew. And I have a, a video that I'm rather proud of that kind of goes over the different kinds of powdery mildew in broad spectrum called what is powdery mildew? And um, because uh, basically it, we should acknowledge that not all species are going to affect cannabis. And so just because you have powdery mildew right next to your plants doesn't mean that it's going to be a suitable host. And the evolution of, can of, a, of a powdery mildew in general is kind of an interesting one. Uh, there's some speculation that uh, actually powdery mildew, before it was the erysipheles, before they were what they are, um, were perhaps soil pathogens. And that over time, they, became, they went from decomposer to parasite because they essentially um, developed more traits that would uh, allow them to take up a more parasitic role. And in the study of symbiosis, this can happen a number of different ways. Um, it's not just a pathogen uh, influence, but it's also the influence of how the host, you know, develops and its sort of ancestral uh, predispositions in that way. But essentially, if uh, you can even have like a mutualistic organism become a parasite, if like maybe it develops a few too many um, genes that allow it to like like I was saying earlier, kind of like a um, melt away or dissolve like plant cells and things like that. So like the the tools that it uses to decompose plant matter became um, 
exaptated, essentially, as a technical term for like when a, a trait get, that's used for one purpose gets used for another purpose, like a horn being used to damage like competitive mates then gets used to like open fruit or something like that. You know what I mean? Okay. And so that, that happens. Um, and so perhaps that's how powdery mildews became uh, parasites. And uh, that being said, people who um, study like powdery mildews of different pe- uh, different plants and are trying to do inoculation tests do basically what you're talking about. Um, they of course confirm that the strain of powdery mildew they have is actually virulent in general and not like hypovirulent because that could cause issues. Uh, and they also make sure that it's a species that they uh, are that they think that is reasonably sure that will transmit. But if they don't know. That's what they do. They literally like do an inoculation test. They put the powdery mildew leaves with all that canidia and they just put it on the plant and see what sticks. Like sometimes it is that easy. You know what I mean? But you just have to know what you're you're working with. Okay. Yeah. Little information goes a long way. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, uh, so yeah. what what else do we have here? Uh, so, okay. We we uh, can, we're talking can, can about I, fungus we, quite a bit. Can, can yeah. we stick on powdery mildew for one second? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so different people. I, I remember. Uh, I think I was talking to James Loud and uh, like Greg McAllister in the chat was like, add silica, uh, you know, baking so you know, spraying baking soda. I, I forget. James Loud mentioned a specific product that he loves to combat powdery mildew. But kind of, what are some strategies to combat it? Um, so, uh, like you mentioned the, the silica and so like, um, when some, so some plants will sequester, um, silica to, uh, it sort of strengthens the cellular wall. I'm actually not under, I'm not totally sure in all the different contexts that this can happen, but I believe that's what's being kind of referenced here. Um, cause I have read some research about some of the really interesting aspects of like silica and this uh, sequestration cause it's not a nutrient, right? But um, when it gets taken up, it basically gets kind of used in the construction of um, the tissues, or rather it gets deposited, might be a, a better way to like articulate that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think is maybe going to be a lot more useful in the future is utilizing like irradiation, uh, ultraviolet radiation, for example. Now, of course, under the sun, that is where you're getting a lot of UV. But uh, the atmosphere does protect against um, sort of the more the more um, intense UV uh, rays, and so I'm curious. I'm cautiously optimistic about the use of irradiation in cannabis for uh, various molds, and I've seen research that shows that if you have the right intensity and you apply it for the right amount of time, uh, even something as strong as like UVB or UVC. Uh, spectra can be very useful against powdery mildew because it, it literally um, it, it physically destroys and, and like disrupts the the, um, uh, the the organism at a genetic level. You know, it gives it a really bad sunburn, essentially a lethal sunburn. Mm-hmm. But you have to be careful that you don't also do the same to your plants. Uh, For example. I- I know a remedy that I wouldn't recommend for cannabis, but I, I knew a farmer that he would uh, spray his fields. He was a dairy farmer and he would spray his fields with raw milk to take care of fungus problems in his grasses and everything. He had some of the most beautiful, healthy grass you ever see and his, uh, his cows were the same. But the, something about that raw milk, I guess the bacillus in there is, uh, was what was eating away. I don't uh, Who knows? It was just he was a, an older uh, Indian farmer and he that's what he did back over there and then he did uh, he did the same thing when he was living here so, so like i said i wouldn't recommend recommend that for cannabis but for your squash plants peter a little little raw milk might be, do you some good what I do you mean, think about that, that i mean on that note you could uh i mean a lot of people are um more and more interested in sort of the microbiome of their plants and so not just the soil microbiome but the phytobiome and the epiphytes and things you can get on the leaves and I'm a big, strong advocate of uh, inoculating your plant uh, inside the tissues with endophytes, but also uh, outside on top of the tissues with epiphytes and microbes that would um, sort of disrupt uh, various pathogens, not just powdery mildew. How long you been battling this, Peter? Like all season? 
still there. No, no, kind of only recently. It seems like with the squash, it kind of comes out at the tail end of the the growth cycle. I don't know if it's the season or the growth cycle or whatever it is, but uh... that was my experience growing um, a lot of zucchini. Is that when I let the leaves get people have told me that because the leaves got really massive and there wasn't a lot of airflow that that was a uh, sort of a facilitating effect. Um, but I do feel like as a season kind of, I didn't have any like especially resistant cultivars that I was familiar with. So, um, you know, I, I, my understanding is that when it gets kind of into this autumnal se season, that uh, that's when it just becomes more active, but I'm sure it's more complicated than that. Yeah, but I do want to try the like my brother and his wife uh, have a yogurt company and they have a facility, they have a factory here in LA. And one of the byproducts is whey. And uh, I just want to get a big like gallon of whey and then dilute it down and spray that and see what happens uh, for that and also for other purposes too. Yeah, you should try it out. Um, I've I've had people come to me who have tried that and had it not really work. And I've had other people who've ascribed efficacy. So maybe you should try it. It would probably make a good video. Carry on, Elka. Oh, okay. Uh, what else do we have here? Yeah, the the moths you were talking about like how how big of an issue is it is it that you mentioned the corn earworm is it as much of a problem in cannabis buds as it is in corn because those things can i've, I've seen the corn earworm uh put people out of business like they they just quit farming yeah. because they couldn't deal with it anymore like and they were a chemical farmers so corn soybean switchers all of that and even with all of the shit that they were spraying they still could that it, it just uh, the uh, a worm defeated them and put their put their family out of business so uh, is it like that is or some of these moths like that with cannabis buds or is it kind of more of a mild infestation yeah definitely um there's a lot of there are a lot of moths that the larvae of which um, can cause massive crop loss. Um, not as much in cannabis is the uh, various armyworms a problem in the same way, but like fall armyworm and uh, yellow striped armyworm and all these other armyworm type moths in the noctuity uh, are a global problem, massive problem in China, massive problem in Africa, and massive problem in North America. Um, and also I think Europe as well. Um, so they're, they're, they're a huge issue and, um, you know, you can't even escape them in some of the Midwestern states. Um, there's a fellow that I follow who I believe is a research extension agent and professor. Um, uh, and I'm forgetting where, but I think it's in Kentucky on Twitter. I follow him and, uh, he was posting like a few weeks ago about all, <laughs> he was doing all these, uh, butterfly net sweeps just in like the plants. Uh, and he, he's just getting like dozens and dozens of, of the larvae. Um, and then like he goes to like golf a week later and he's like, man, I can't even uh, I can't even get rid of these when I'm going on vacation or whatever, uh, because they were all on the field, too. Like they're everywhere. Now, to answer your question, corn earworm, tobacco budworm, uh, other of these helicoverpa sort of type moths um, also in the noctuity. Those are also really incessantly problematic, not just in cannabis, but also in other crops. Uh, but they're a, they're primarily a problem in cannabis because we want the flower. And of course, like if a worm gets in your fruit, you know, that becomes kind of a, um, you know, an unacceptable problem uh, for the produce. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to toss it uh, usually. But um, the, the flower material, like e the issue is that even if you, um, treat the caterpillar, even if you kill the caterpillar, um, if it gets onto the flower or if it burrows into the bud, or in the case of like the Eurasian hemp borer, which I also made a video about recently, um, if you kill it somehow, some way, um, it dies and rots in the product or in the stems, which will lead up to the product. Um, so you, that's the really major problem is that even when you win, you still lose, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. Why e 
even having spiders in your uh, bud is a problem because they they weave webs and that traps moisture yeah. and you get bud rot in there you think oh i got a spider in there it's taking care of the bugs well no it's creating rot for you now so it's, it's even if you think you got a good bug in there it can create problems so this is and uh oh, right. Oh. bug shit like those you're talking about those worms is all of their little poop pellets as that's yes. bacteria here and there is so yeah a, there's a reason why this was grown indoors for so long it's, it, it almost it's like they they kind of gave us a blessing by pushing us indoors for a little bit you know and now that people are, are outdoors again it's like okay now we're dealing with actual farming and it kind of sucks <laughs> <laughs> kind of right uh, yeah. I feel like it's like Normandy over here. Like, <laughs> I don't can't know if you guys can hear that. I can't tell if it's your planes or because I've got uh, the planes cross here, but not as not this often. So I, I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely here too. Um, but uh, you're you're totally right. Um, that like uh, the so sort of controlled environment agriculture uh, has its benefits there, and it's why I'm a big advocate for what are called physical controls in IPM. Um, I tell a lot of people that my favorite way to defend against the moth, um, various moths, is that you, you don't want to concentrate on the larvae because when the larvae are on your plant, you've kind of already lost a bit. Um, what you really want to do is you want to sequester your plants from the moths and keep them from being able to oviposit because except for like the army worms that I talked about, and that's how they get their name because they can travel between plants. Um, they're also called cutworms because they sometimes will just shear through uh, the stems of plants, especially like kind of younger subpolar plants. Um, so they just cut right through your plants, which is a problem. But uh, these other plant, these other larvae, they're not going to do that. So if you keep the moth from being able to lay eggs on the plant directly, you've kind of already won. You've pretty much already won. The problem is that um, mesh screen can have its own problems um, and difficulties depending on your environment. One of them is that airflow through a sufficiently small um, uh, netting will sort of restrict not only uh, or not only the airflow and, and raise humidity potentially, but also um, there might be a little bit of like a light shading effect depending on how you apply it. So those are things to be keeping in mind, but I feel like I would take those uh, detriments way over the you know potential crop loss of uh, some of these really destructive moths yeah that one that you described that gets inside the stem and just rots in there even after you've killed the damn thing is you you didn't really win like as you said not so really that's, <laughs> so that's the well, you're you you've been a bearer of bad news so far. Do you got any good news for us? Is there any wins on the horizon? I know, right? <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I, at least it's honest. It's like you're not you're not shitting rainbows on me. So, that, it, or is there any? I'm positive not even saying. On? I'm not even saying buy my product. You know what I mean? I'm not saying like <laughs> everything's a problem except for the people who use this X Y Z. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it is. Uh, it is uh, without bias that I say these things, or at least, you know, with empirical bias, I suppose, or as much as I can. Um, but well, to me, to me, your product would be consulting. Like, that's how I would. I suppose like, that's what... true. A service, right? Definitely a yes. service. That's actually a really excellent point. Um, yes. And that way, I guess you could call it a, a bias. Maybe some. I have been accused sometimes of being a bit of a fear monger. And I guess that could be a reason why. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that's. That would... I mean, I'm not trying to mom the fear, but um, it's definitely there, um, the threats at least. Um, and I think that, but, but you know, the endearing thing, to give you a more endearing uh, perspective, I do feel like the acceptance of cannabis generally by the public uh, has, of course, facilitated like its representation, um, you know, in political spheres and, you know, its acknowledgement. And maybe even some of the attenuation of, um, in, at least in some cases, uh, certainly not in the cases that I like to see, but uh, punishing that um, um, sort of like really harsh prohibitive nature, at least in certain areas. And that's the first step towards um, people being able to do research, people being able to like actually make products and services and 
and uh, defenses against the various pests that we're talking about, not just the viruses, but also like these moths and things like this that are, that are really quite lethal. And as a community, we have to come together and share the information, share our experiences. Many people know that I'm a, a big advocate of kind of holding off and looking for sort of empirical information when possible, but that's not that's not acceptable for people who um, kind of make it or break it on their crops like many farmers do. And many farmers are also quite old and in various places they are um, not well supported, including the United States. So, you know, the average farmer is like in their 60s, mid 60s, I think, last time I looked at the census. And, um, you know, that's a major importance. And so if we're able to support each other, if, if, if this information stimulates that sort of like um, camaraderie, uh, both in the research sectors, in the private sector, but also in, in the residential sector, all of us kind of as people, um, then I think that's a, a powerful force that we can harness kind of collectively. Yeah, that's a, I agree with that. Uh, so, and it's, it, it is nice that it's becoming more accepted. Uh, so I can talk to it. I, t I can talk to my mother-in-law about it now. And that, that wasn't the case a few years ago. So that's a, for me personally, that's a positive direction. But just the, the general acceptance and uh, universities studying it now, like I, I was taking my dog to the vet a few weeks back, like uh, on a daily basis, basically, or every other day sometimes. But as I was uh, the one of the most pleasant things about it is that I was uh, passing acres and acres of research hemp on, on the way there and back and just smelling it in the air and seeing it waving in the wind and just it's how it should be. It's just the plant. And, you know, so it, it, it's really ridiculous what this just uh, really harmless thing has been put through and all of the uh, the hoops that everyone has had to jump through to that has loved it over the years. So it's, it's I'm, I'm very happy that the current generation is uh, passionate about it as even if they're just passionate about cookies, I don't smoke what you want, man. But uh, it just uh, having that, that same passion that all of us have had, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was, I'm probably in the, the second wave, but the, I'm, I'm glad that some of the original guys like Greg and Sam and, uh, Rob Clark and it's like they're still kicking and they're still teaching and it's it's really a beautiful thing so it's like the the young the the new generation is is really making me happy with the the passion that they have for it and so it's like they're arguing over stupid stuff like what kind of uh, nutrients you use to grow and I, was, I think that all of that's gonna go by the wayside once we uh, uh, form that collectiveness that you were talking about when we have a collective purpose and it's like, look, we're, we're all oppressed in our own ways, whether even if you've grown up in the so-called legal environment now, there's as you know, there's still all of that oppression still there. And it's like in California, there's raids still happening. And it's like it's how it's it's kind of uh, thanks, bamboo for keeping keeping the alert up for people. And, you know, it's just it's just sad to see some of it. But it's also, like I was saying, seeing the younger generation sharing the passion that we've all had for it over the years. And it's just it's it's a beautiful thing. It's got I'm getting kind of emotional thinking about it. So it's, it's, I, I really I dug what you were saying there, man. I, I appreciate that sentiment. I appreciate that, too. I'm, um, you know, that's why I you know, that's why we that's why Cheddar Bob is familiar with who I am or how you are familiar with who I am. Um, it's because I make that outreach. And it's very important for me to be available uh, kind of as much as possible. I have my limits, everyone does, and I'm just one person. Um, so I guess the thing that I'm really excited about is that there will be many other people, hopefully more people, um, sort of like to take that, um, you know, that, that uh, baton, you know, and continue on, like kind of like what you're sort of alluding to. And, uh, Hopefully, that will be able to stem the tide of problems that we talk about with rares and pests. There are still major hurdles to undertake, but um, I do feel confident that there are solutions in the future. We just have to ha rely on people to kind of find those solutions, and some of them are going to be found in, um, well, they're going to be found in sort of, sort of empirical experimentation, and some of them are going to be using techniques that we've used for 
millennia already. Okay. Did you hear that, younger people out there that are thinking about going to school for botany? Maybe become an entomologist and give this guy some help out there, you know? He, he's <laughs> obviously, there's not many of them out there, so maybe give that a consideration. I think so, I remember reading a report a while ago that was looking at, like, the various, like, biological, like, disciplines, like botany or, like, uh, ornithology, like, birds and, and bugs and, and all the other things. And they were looking at, like, how many of those animals exist or organisms exist and how many researchers are there to study them, like virologists and other things like, and, and because of like the statistic I already told you, you know, the ratio between people who study insects and the amount of insects there are is of course, you know, massively <laughs> underrepresented. Same with virologists for obvious reasons and other microbiologists. But uh, I think the over most overrepresented group my, I think was actually ornithology I think it was like birds really um, yeah well, they are beautiful <laughs> that's true uh, yeah, that's, that's true a, uh, somebody I'm was asking talking. about the the birds behind me and it was hummingbirds buzzing around most likely yeah so, I see you have a hummingbird feeder yeah they're and, all over the place just quickly because we're talking entomology uh, next Friday we got if I can cue this up <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. From Kansas State University Department of Entomology, Raymond Cloyd. I know him. Nice. So he'll be uh, <laughs> nice. giving a presentation around, uh, I think, 9 a.m. Pacific time next Friday. All right. I'll be there. Uh, people should ask him about uh, the crazy sex lives of parasitoid wasps. He will get a kick out of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It, yeah. and people can remember that because I will probably forget. It's funny, though, because as we were talking about Caterpillar, I went out uh, to cut a bunch of the uh, the flowers off the, um, the mint because literally every time I do it, I find caterpillars. And, of course, the one time I want to show... <laughs> the caterpillar, I cannot find them. But, uh, oh, I know, right? There, I have all the little heads the mint uh flower heads uh in this little tray sorry nobody can see that <laughs> i can that, see it a little bit in that tree yeah. right there <laughs> gonna roll up a, a mint spliff yes <laughs> yes there we go <laughs> so i there, use the uh, mint when my stomach's upset uh, i'll eat a little bit of that mint and it'll, it really just is like it, it, it's amazing i learned that from my aunt she'd always send me out there is here go go pick some of that mint and you'll be all right in about 10 minutes and it, it works i used to cultivate a lot of mint um just like personally i'm a big lemon balm fan myself i like lemon balm yeah was, i've got some of that back here too it, it works for keeping the bugs away sort of but not really uh, you got to get it ruffled up and then the bugs don't like it but if it's the plants just sitting there it doesn't really release much of that citronella that it's got in it the, the the variety that I have is pretty pretty pungent though. I it's love like, it when it's like super pungent like that though. So yeah, mine smells a, like pledge. Like yeah, pledge. right. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I mean, moving ha, forward, ha, ha. I go ahead. I was just gonna say I could either I could take uh, questions from the chat potentially. If you yeah, wanted we to, had, to we do had that. a bunch. Uh, Elka, are, are you? Uh, do you have more? Uh, I think that we, we covered pretty much everything that I've got in these notes. I'm on the last page, so I think that we, we went through it. Yeah, uh, so yeah, he negated a lot of these questions by saying that the, using it, the viruses, the viroid structure against it really isn't the best method forward. So that like got rid of about five of my questions. So, that's <laughs> But it's a really it's cool question that you asked. I really like that you asked that question because it's the sort of, it's the sort of thing that I, you know, I'm not a virologist, but um, it's, it's those kinds of questions that really uh, lead to like novel and clever uh, treatments and solutions. So it was a good question. All right. <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right. So what were you about to say, Peter? Uh, well, the first one is actually from me. So this, uh, do we think that that's leaf miners? I kind of see in the, like on the right that like large leaf in like the bottom left of that leaf, maybe I see something that resembles like a, a, you know I think these are leaf mines yeah yeah definitely now that I'm looking at it more, 
and uh, and what would be uh, what would be prevention mitigation strategies with leaf miners? I was I was talking to Tyler from Family Tree Seeds, who's actually going to uh, pick up some traps for leaf miners, and I told him to pick me up some. Um, I guess they're what pheromone traps or something, and oh really? Um, but theoretically, if you had leaf, because I think in um, uh, I had some visuals queued up from the uh, IPM Discord. And I think there was a cannabis leaf miner one. If you 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 do you remember that one? I do actually. I think I um. I definitely. Let me just see if it. I can. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what. While a... I'm looking up this stuff, so from the chat earlier, um. C Web asked, "What does everybody think about dunking plants?" I read my grow of. I rid my grow of HR mites by cutting clones of everything and then dipping those clones in a solution, throwing away the host infected plants. That's definitely one way to go about it. I've never dunked a plant. My thing with mites that has always worked for me and I'm helping a guy out in Cali right now with it is uh, ice water, like really cold water. It doesn't damage the leaves and uh, Cold water, of course, isn't going to wash your resin away. It might take some of the smell away for a little bit, but it comes back. But uh, really cold water with mites seems to. That's all. I, I don't know about that russet mite you all are dealing with out there. Cold water may not. You may have to go sulfur or something with that. But uh, cold water works pretty pretty well up in the flower. You don't want to take it too far to where you might cause some rot. But really cold water has always done me good, inside and out. Just don't get it in the roots. Just get it on the leaves. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, like, that's kind of what I say when I when I talk about, like, a holistic strategy or, like, a multifaceted approach. Um, there's a lot of, like, lethal and even sublethal effects you can apply to various pests preventatively but also curatively to, to sort of disrupt pests. Like I said, to disrupt pests. So even just spraying, like you said, like cold water or some sort of a water to disrupt things like mites or aphids or things like that when used in tandem with other things. Um, or if you only have like a sort of a nascent population, um, you know, that can be enough to disrupt them, to hurt them, uh, to disrupt their colonization. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm an advocate of like low tech uh, methods for sure. Okay, so I think I found, uh, let me... Does that look like leaf miner? Kind of. It's not um, super clear. You know, maybe not. It's a little bit, it's kind of a little bit too um, like pockmarked almost. It's a, uh, I mean, I kind of see what look like trails, but it's hard to really tell. I'm not sure. but I will say that leaf miner tends to not be like a, a really major problem in cannabis in, in my uh, in my experience it tends to be a, a, a much more bigger problem in things like leafy vegetables like you're saying Peter uh, like like what you're experiencing and um, uh, I actually cut my teeth on uh, leaf miners and their and their treatments actually they were a major pest in one of the one of the first places they started to, to help and work with. And um, what they used were Deglyphus wasps, Deglyphus isaia. And that works really well for people, but um, it's in a commercial setting because they're still going to get some level of loss. Um, and this was actually uh, with growers who, who were not vegetable growers. This was with um, ornamental um, uh, Gerbera daisies. And so the leaves weren't super important. But what would happen is that the leaf miners would parasitize the leaves. The larvae would uh, live in the margins of the leaves. Obviously, that causes problems for the, you know, the the um, vigor of the plant and its growth. And there were times where it got so bad they practically skeletonized the leaves. It was it was quite severe. 
Um, but I uh, helped them with their biocontrol situation. We used diglyphus and for other pests, other kinds of biocontrols, and they were able to achieve uh, quite a bit of control. And uh, weekly they would apply these out. And the, the adults, when they were unchallenged by the wasp, which parasitizes the larvae, um, the adults would get so desperate for leaf material that they would start to, to they call it stinging, but um, it's not a stinger. But what they would do is they would literally like uh, put like in, like uh, penetrate the petals of the flowers, which is a, of course a ma major cosmetic problem. Um, and even though they couldn't lay their eggs appropriately in them, they would still cause damage to the petals. So that's just one of a, a few really good examples that like. Um, insects sometimes get desperate, just like we do. Um, they don't always do things uh, in a way that would be um, intuitive to us. And uh, certainly they can cause damage without feeding or without even being successful, because none of those eggs uh, even um, you know, were viable. So um, interesting things like that. So if you only have like a few, the problem is that if you only have like a few leafy greens, you know, the cost of certain biocontrols and other treatments might not be very useful because they'll, they'll still probably, um, you know, uh, damage the leaves uh, to some small extent, you know what I mean? So it's really a, um, a question about pressure and uh, uh, cost and uh, value of the crop. And you, you, I'm just looking through the Discord, but you had actually answered this one, uh, Ragamuffins. Uh, I don't know if I can go. No, I can't go. You guys can see this, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I think you had said it was... Uh, I think it looked like a bark lab, yeah, yeah bark or a socopterin. Actually, I get uh, I get socoptera and siloidia mixed up all the time. Um, so I believe that socoptera is bark lice, now that I think about it. But uh, yeah, it didn't look like an aphid or anything like that. They have kind of like a, a really specific sort of morphology. Um, the first couple of uh, pictures actually made me think, oh, is that like an aphid? But no, it, was, it wasn't bulbous enough, and it did, didn't have the cornicles, and it had like a, a way too different uh, head. Can you show that yeah. picture again, Peter? Like, if I saw that, I would not imagine that a bug had done that. I thought I would think that uh, like the nutrient. No, no, no. Th this, is, this is someone different. Th this oh, is okay. a completely separate uh, uh, photo. Yeah, I would have been like, how did I burn it? That's, okay, no, never mind. That has nothing to do with that bug. Sorry. Oh, yeah, this was some sort of uh, fly. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I or somebody else actually answered the question as to what this was. But um, Someone I don't said think Western I Western was... flower thrip early in its life cycle. Uh, I don't know. That was a reply to somebody else. I know. Yeah. Sorry. GB. Oh, yeah, moose. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Sorry. G. All right. This is, yeah, unfortunately these, let's see if I can open the original. Whoa. Oh, cool. Well, that's not very helpful. So that's what he said is a Western, a thrip early in the life cycle. Yeah. Um... Oh, sorry. You can't see that. Hold on. I can kind of see it. I've gotten very good at looking at small sort of nondescript uh, morphologies and trying to figure out what I think from them. But it does kind of look like a sort of a fusiform cigar-shaped bug a little bit. And the yellow coloration kind of reminds me. But um, there's like over, there's like I think over 6,000 documented species of thrips at this point. And only a small fraction of them are actually really pestiferous. Um, in cannabis, I've seen Western flower thrips. Um, there's, there are perhaps other thrips that feed on cannabis, but um, can't always easily distinguish one species from another. And the only reason why people say Western flower thrips, like myself, is because it's the main one that I see. And it's also the, uh, pretty much the most common thrips. Um, I think like almost, 
I was reading a report that like practically half of the research that comes off comes um, out about thrips is about specifically this species of Western flower thrips. So they're really, really um, uh, a major focus. They're very prolific. Uh, but I also see bean thrips, which are, uh, which actually I think are in that uh, Discord channel. I think there was somebody who posted some black and white thrips, and those are, um, uh, Cali I think it's Calia or Calio thrips. I made a video about them too, um, a short observational video about them. But uh, uh, there's a few different species of thrips that have that black white banding, but uh, bean thrips are a really common pest. So it, it is perhaps what they are. Um... Sour Diesel asked, actually, speaking of thrips, asked, uh, what about nematodes against thrips? Tried them, but didn't have great results. Yeah, so um, I'm familiar with ways that people use nematodes for uh, for thrips in general. Uh, you, can, you can, in some cases, actually apply them uh, as a foliar spray. Uh, but I feel like this is a super useful way, and it comes with some caveats, like if it's too hot, um, that can be a problematic, of course. They'll dry out too quickly and things like this. So there are, there are some niche examples of like foliar application, but by and large, people are using it for um, terrestrial um, and like mildly subterrestrial um, pupae. So like when the larva has fed enough and pupates, a lot of times it'll fall into the soil. And this has um, the function of kind of hiding it from potential pests on the plant but it also introduces it to risks that are near the soil. So I don't know how truly beneficial it is uh, in aggregate, but when you apply the nematodes, then they go and they search out for a host and they can um, sort of colonize the thrips pupa and then you, um, you have less thrips. So you're disrupting the life cycle of those thrips. The problem is that you have to do that a lot because you, if you only disrupt from one node, one part of the life cycle. Um, I don't feel like that's a very strong um, sort of a treatment. You should be looking to affect, ideally, as many aspects of the life cycle as possible and utilizing multiple avenues to that end. So you might like apply a, a botanical insecticide that will affect all of the different life stages or most of them. Um, you might also use the nematode so that you uh, have some sort of a residual uh, control that's existing in the soil for however long it does without a host and that kind of a thing. And maybe even like Bouveria bassiana could be like that too, another sort of pa uh, pathogen that you can apply to the soil or to the foliage. So Chris yes. Guerrero sent this of, uh, is that a corn earworm uh, <laughs> coming out of? It's a little hard to see, but I feel like it might be um because uh i actually have a video again not to like be not to shamelessly plug so much but um helicoverpa larvae are notoriously difficult to um uh to identify visually anyways um species to species and in some cases different species in that genus can inter uh interbreed uh, which makes this of course even more difficult uh, but it does it does have that kind of like morphology. I'm not sure how to describe it, like the um, kind of like the coloration matches. But they can they, the caterpillars also change colors quite a bit, and they can have very a very great phenotypic plasticity. Um, I I would be willing to bet that that is um, at the very least something in Helicoverpa. And then also from Chris Guerrero, he was uh, very enthusiastic to share his Amazon purchase. <laughs> very nice yeah because because um, like oh sorry yeah go ahead i was just gonna say like um for my personal recommendation i like that people try to use um what's called thrip screen which is a uh very very tightly like wound um uh, a mesh screen that doesn't even allow thrips which are very very small to get through generally, uh, which will also sort of limit the uh, passage of other pests too that you don't like. Of course, moths are way larger than this, but
But if you can get rid of multiple insects at once instead of just one, like I would go for it. The only, the only uh, you know thing to consider is, like I said before, uh, if the holes are really small, like in the case of thrip screen, then you do get a shading perhaps issue for those who that matters for, um, and you can also have issues with air passage and, and the humidity increases. Um, sometimes people will apply them um, concave, convexly. Um, so like they're like they like bow out or something like this and so that allows you to have more surface area for the air to like move through and get a little bit more um passage you can kind of compensate for it but if you're not worried about any of those things uh then you can have less of that problem with like a, a larger um poor mesh screen so i definitely think that it's not the only option are, are people having problems with thrips outdoors or is this a, I only had thrip problems indoors and I haven't had them since I started painting my floors. I paint my floors every in every grow room that I build now. I paint my floors with this epoxy paint and no mites, no thrips, nothing. And I, I'm very careful about what I wear in and out of there and all of that, obviously, and shower and stuff like that. But as that painted floor has seemed to really help. I don't know if it was just that I got really vigilant when I started doing that or if the epoxy floor itself, because stuff like said, like even after it's been dry for years, it's still kind of sticky. So it's really hard for anything to crawl from even the other part of the house in there and cause problems. And so that's uh, the, my original question is, is our, I've never seen thrips outdoors. Is this a, a problem people are having outdoors? All the time. Thrips really? are... You mean in cannabis, like, I mean, generally, thrips are, uh, they're super prolific and they're really good at invading new um, environments, essentially. Humans are really good at helping them along with this. Um, so we have some part to play here, but by and large, um, thrips are really small and winged and they get around really easily and they cause a lot of massive crop damage in general. Um, the species that are considered really pestiferous anyways. Other ones are basically, you know, they might do a little bit of feeding, but they don't cause a whole lot of problems for um, for the for the host, for the plant host. Um, and in cannabis, I've, I've seen different places have different issues. Um, actually, right now, where I'm at, at in Southern California, uh, we just had a really great rain. Uh, we had a really cool uh, lightning storm that kind of came out of nowhere um last night and uh thrips are uh they have a historical name in english called thunderbug and they're called thunderbugs because that change in uh atmospheric pressure um really facilitates them that wind travel and movement and a lot of insects rely on wind to do that so um yeah look at this i literally saw clouds <laughs> of thrips around my outdoor sunflowers this year oh, yes man. I exactly. must live in a lucky environment because we don't have that. They're around, obviously, because I used to bring them inside, but it's that they're not an issue here. We we have other issues, so that, well, that's really sad to hear. Clouds of thrips, <laughs> yuck. One thing, one thing, uh, one thing about it is there's this concept in ecology called diffusion, um, and basically this idea that like when you have like um like I see the sea of of different plants in your background. And it's kind of like that, where um, basically because there's there's essentially a lot of other things going around or like existing. Um, thrips are super generalist, so maybe it's less of a problem for them. But uh, they, if a pest can't find the the host, then that's a, a huge problem for it. And so if you're a plant that's existing with a bunch of other plants, that can kind of help you sort of blend in and not be as as much of a target. And maybe that's ha helping you a little bit, plus all the other organisms and things that might be predating on them or catching them or making life difficult for them. Um, but that's one reason why uh, when I hear people say that they've never had like thrifts before, they've never had certain pests that are, I, I just know that like, it's been documented that they're incredibly egregiously prolific. Um, you know, perhaps it's because of their location and location plays a massive role in, in cultivation uh, even with uh, in, in nature, you can have a pathogen ravage through um, like various plants or, or one species and it might kill 99%. But maybe there's some that exist in like a relict or like a, a, um, a some sort of refuge 
we call refugia, and then that population can build back up from that like practical, um, you know, into extirpation. And uh, throughout millions of years, this has happened to many lineages of plants um, that might have like hung on by a thread, but they're they're still uh, around. Yeah, that's kind of like earlier you were talking about the common ancestor between hops and cannabis. It's like somewhere along the line, it got it it was pressured out, and now we just have what we have now. Has, has you ever seen the movie Caveman with Ringo Starr in it? They have a cannabis plant in there that's got berries on it. I wonder if that's the, the they had some insight into that. As that was the it, it it because the hop is kind of like a berry, you know, and the cannabis flower is a we we all know what that looks like but it's, it's, i've always found that interesting that they decided to put little red berries on the cannabis plants in the movie caveman that's a, just a little stoner side note but a, yeah that you you kind of mentioned that earlier with the, the common ancestor of uh, cannabis and hops being pressured out so that's anyway sorry yeah well no 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 that's i i like that i honestly think that um uh, it kind of reminds me of something that i've said before which is that I'm sure I'm not unique in this, and I think I've heard of people trying to do something like this before, but um, it would be kind of cool if the flower material wasn't, like if we could make, if we could breed for plants that were so resinous, and some of these cultivars that I've been seeing all, pretty much fits this description, that the leaves are practically as trichomous as the flower. And, it, and if that was indeed possible, where the trichomes could have like cannabinoids and other terpenes and, and be practically as potent, wouldn't it be like kind of amazing that you could just you could roll up a you could roll up a leaf instead of a flower like and, and get like maybe not the exact same effects or maybe not the exact same volume. Uh, so that kind of almost yeah. looks like a hibiscus plant or a hibiscus flower. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hilarious movie. They they don't speak in it. There's like there's no words to that movie. It's 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 really it's, it's kind of genius the way they put. They really thing committed together. to it. Yeah, really committed to. I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. Yeah, so th I think that was made in the '80s. My dad really liked that movie, and he liked The Gods Must Be Crazy. You ever seen that one? Uh, I have not start... seen that one, but I've heard of it. Yeah, it's, it all starts with a Coke bottle being thrown out of a plane, and all of a sudden, there's a new god in town. It's a, yeah, it's hilarious stuff. But those those old '80s comedy movies, they had some interesting things, that, like that cannabis plant. They did really didn't show the berries so much in that picture, but you you kind of get the. I idea. see like a green, like kind of like what looks like a berry-like structure. I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just quickly, this is uh, Chris Guerrero's updated close-up. Oh man, I'm glad I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, come to Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> or come to yeah. California in general. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Um, you know, the hairs don't match. I don't I don't think that is um, Helico Verpa. I'm not sure. I really love to see like a head capsule. Um, that can be really useful. Right now we're seeing like a, sort of like a the back of it. But all those small little, like it's almost like bristling with hairs. And I feel like Although other helicoverpa larvae can be like this, um, I feel like they're not quite as pubescent. You know, they're not quite as hairy as this larva is here. So it might be something different. Uh, where is this located? Was this also in California? The corn worms I've seen are always brown and smooth. I've never seen a green one. They're always either light or dark brown, depending on how old they are. And, and their size matters on how much corn they've been eating, little bastards. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and like in some cases, like there's some pests, I think even some like these larvae where they'll like, they'll eat like a few kernels of the corn or whatever, and then they'll just leave it for something else. Like they don't even finish it, yeah. you know, like. Just enough to ruin it. Just enough to, yeah, just enough to ruin it, create a wound, and then cause other problems. Like it's yeah. uh, poop in there a little bit. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this was mine, and then just go away. <laughs> yeah, as corn has so many problems anyway, is just getting it pollinated in itself is an issue because you get those spotty corn. Uh, Peter knows what I'm talking about. He just had this issue with corn too, and as 
uh, uh, Hardy did it. So you know that he was breeding for large kernels, but it's just the pollination, getting it pollinated right. Especially the way that Peter's set up is, is, is he doesn't have a lot of, lot of space. So it's not like rows of corn where the tassels are really getting in there and, and doing the job they're supposed to be doing. But as I, I, I kind of feel for the corn farmers, at least the sweet corn farmers. If you're growing dent corn and soybeans, you're, out, you're not really doing much for the world. So uh, move on. But uh, around here, there's a lot of sweet corn farmers. They grow a lot of that Stoll's evergreen. That stuff is kind of resistant to the the earworm. Just it, not really, but it, they can they can knock it back and still have enough of the harvest to where they can make some money on the crop and sell a lot of wonderful white sweet corn. Is that if, if you never had an ear of Stoll's evergreen, you're missing out. I think I have actually. I had a um, family friend. Uh, who like that's she loved like growing up she loved uh, squash as she would always uh, she would always uh, pronounce it um, and uh, uh, corn big corn fan I'm almost positive that it probably has something like that but maybe not maybe I have uh, you know even more delicious you know fruits of agriculture to to snack on you know yeah. um, that stole is evergreen that, that... living in California is nice though for that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a, you, you all are feeding the world in a lot of ways, not just America. There's the, the, there's some weird stuff going on there, though. It's like you you grow bananas, and or not bananas, I'm sorry, uh, oranges. Florida grows oranges. You all send oranges back and forth to each other. It's like it really doesn't make much sense. It's like how some of this works, but I imagine it's a su supply thing, th supply chain thing that's a above my my level so i'm sure there's a reason for it but it just doesn't make much sense if you why ship oranges to florida florida's got oranges and vice versa mm -hmm. and you know it's it, it, it's under the reason i was thinking bananas is because it makes sense for bananas to be grown in the tropics and shipped everywhere it's really the only place that you're going to get your your banana from uh, other than like the the niche banana growers like family tree is like you know as the those aren't available to everybody uh, guys like me, I'm lucky to get a Chiquita, you know? Just... <laughs> wow. So denigrating. <laughs> a lowly Chiquita. Yeah. Well, There's a lot that went into the production of bananas. Not all of it really nice, but um, that, I mean, that's true. I also don't claim to understand all of the market dynamics. And, you know, um, it probably does have its own little weird idiosyncrasies that maybe disallow it from being intuitive. Uh, but I think there's a lot of um, research that happens uh, between various like orange breeders and cultivators and researchers. So California is a pretty, pretty big international force for that. And um, I think Florida is too. So I think they just kind of work together and they just happen to have uh, a uh, political, social, and geographical climate that's conducive. And I guess if there's money to be made for it, then they're going to do that. Yeah. As, have you had one of those sumo mandarins yet? Like the oh, real, yes. real big man? I love those things. Whoever bred that, thumbs up, man. You did a great job on that tree. That's, well, wow. <laughs> while we're talking about that, I'm just going to say that my favorite, um, I forget if they're tangerines or if they're oranges, actually on the top uh, but a uh, gold nugget cultivar i think they're oranges um okay. or maybe tangerines gosh i don't remember but uh they're they're, they're like mandarin are they a mandarin they're um they're kind of tart but they're also sweet and uh they kind of got this like zing that i'm a a, a big proponent of <laughs> i really like them if all of my citrus tasted that wonderful um, I would eat a lot more citrus than they already do. And then, of course, with the citrus screening disease being a problem for so long, I was, um, I was really, uh, I was really sad and, and kind of like worried that I might not have my citrus for a while. But, uh, there, we've actually found that, um, in, you know, I'm just going to go on a small attention here for those who are familiar, which I think some of the people in the chat are, uh, cause I recognize some of the names, um, uh, citrus green disease is caused by a bacteria called a phytoplasma. And there are actually phytoplasmas that infect and are lethal to uh, cannabis in particular. But phytoplasmas are, are poorly understood and they're very 
hard to research because you can't like um, they're parasites, they're obligate parasites of plants and they're only vectored by insects. So it's very hard to culture them and study them. Anyways, apparently it's not even a pathogen. Apparently, uh, and what I mean by this is that it doesn't as a nature, like from a, so I guess you could say it's a kind of like a pathogen, it generates a, a pathology. But um, what I mean to say is that it's not a parasite in ecological terms. It's not a parasite of citrus. What it does is it colonizes the plant and it doesn't actually like siphon resources or cause dysfunction in physiology in order to sustain itself. Uh, simply just by being in the citrus, it causes a hyperintensive immune response in, in some cultivars over others, but, but most plants. Uh, or most of the citrus. And so when the um, the researchers, and I'm trying to remember the research, but basically the researchers were able to alleviate the stress response of the plant by, um, by uh, regulating the redox reactions in the, in the physiology. And also um, I have a post on my Instagram that talks about it in more detail because it was so fascinating. But uh, basically, they're able to, to using like I think hormones and also a few other compounds to alleviate the physiological response uh, to the organism. Uh, all the symptoms went away, and the organism, the bacteria, still stayed in the plant. Um, there's a, other research earlier about using uh, oak leaf oak leaf extract, and that the various com chemicals in it were able to eradicate, I think, the bacteria, or possibly in this case, combined with the new research, possibly um, sort of modulate the stress response. And I think that stuff is really fascinating. Apparently it's the first example of like this kind of like non-pathogenic dysfunction in plants. Apparently it has happened in other cases, like in some animals, like even humans, uh, but it's a pretty, it's pretty uncommon that the dysfunction is not caused from like, like true blue parasitism, if that makes sense. Like actually like taking resources from the host. So yeah, cool that stuff. reminds me, that reminds me of something that I read about snake bites is uh, some of the snake bites that uh, work neurologically that uh, the venom doesn't kill the human that it bites. It's the human freaking out and having an anxiety reaction and just like, pumping the stuff through them even faster because they, oh, I got bit by a cobra. I'm going to die. They actually kill themselves with that. The, the response, like you were saying with this, they, they die from the response to it, not the actual amount of venom that they were saying. It's just the way that they reacted to it that causes the problem. So that's interesting. Like the person or, the, or like the body's reaction? Uh, they were saying that it, 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 it doesn't happen with ne the necrotic snake bites. It only happens oh, with the, the neurological venom. So it's, oh. it's kind of a combination of two. It's, it's uh, if the person, like say somebody that's already like susceptible to having an anxiety attack and all of the blood pumping and all of that. Oh, sure. Yeah. That, yeah. that is what will kill yeah. them. The shock of the, oh, I got bit by whatever, as opposed to the amount of venom that actually got in them. If it was just something that, you know, one of those things you re read on like National Geographic or something, but it, it was, it was fascinating to me as I read that it, as a kid. Isn't that cool? Like the, like venomics is a really fascinating subject and I'm not going to get a, like in the, in the weeds on this, but, um, you know, long story short, a lot of like, at least reptilian, but also like arthropod venom, uh, from what I've been able to see is, um, it's basically like saliva that got uh, really good at its job, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> you know, yeah. to really oversimplify it, you know, a, a lot of the like, because people like ask the question, well, where did the venom come from? What was it before venom, if anything? And I guess like sal uh, saliva glands in various organisms. And, uh, you know, you get a, a couple of neat, you know, mutations and, you um, you know, repeats of like certain compounds and you get a really good um, venom. And uh, then of course it gets even better from there. So uh, that stuff is, is pretty fascinating. But I guess it's because you're really just exploiting the way that your body um, deals with certain compounds like hormones and stuff. 
Um, so like, you know, if you get that, com if you get those compounds in certain doses in certain other areas, everything's fine, just like certain kinds of medicine, but the dose makes the poison, um, essentially. Speaking of hormones in that paper on those papers that you sent me, they were, uh, you were talking about that, or they were talking about how the plants use their hormones to like essentially once they get under attack from uh, like I think it was the aphids, it was the aphid paper that you sent. Is once they start getting chewed on, they start releasing these combinations of hormones to put an end to it. Basically, is make the uh, make it unpalatable for mm -hmm. whatever is chewing on them is, is that like a, a way forward where you can like alter the the hormone in the plant or like breed for something that has a little bit more jabrelin in it but isn't a uh isn't going to go full male on you or a herm and you know you know what i'm saying but is yeah it no absolutely that's that's kind of the basic like when people you're totally right it's like the fundamental or I guess you could say like one of the fundamental aspects of like resistance breedings in plants. So, um, so like gene based resistance, you can also have environmental factors like what we do to like keep the moths off of your plants. It's like an environmental, you know, control or environmental factor of resistance, right? In nature, it might be because it's in a cave or something and it's away from its pests or whatever as, a, as an example. But gene based resistance is typically mediated by something like a hormone or a toxic compound of some kind some sort of a toxin that is going to negatively affect like in this case like the herbivore and then the herbivore is going to have uh, ways of attenuating those reactions uh, in the plant so the plant has its immune response it has like a basically a passive kind of immune response or a passive immune system so like the literal like you know, outer layer of the leaves and the stem, you know, it's rigidity, it's um, the cuticle, the wax cuticle layer on it. Those are all factors, the trichomes, of course, and things like this. Um, but then like if like an aphid, which I've been doing a lot more uh, reading about uh, lately, uh, you know, if that aphid sticks its stylet into the plant, as soon as it penetrates the, um, the tissue, uh, you know, the, all of those, all of that damage causes things called damage associated molecular patterns or damps. And um, basically various plants have various ways of responding to those signal compounds. Um, and uh, then they produce an immune response and the insect will also have its own ways of like neutralizing those responses. Um, part of that's by just feeding in a specific way to like keep it from happening in the first place, like causing a lot of uh, wounds. That's why aphids are really good at transmitting uh, viruses because um, they tend to not do a whole lot of cellular damage, minimal cellular damage, because they're, they're feeding on the phloem sap. And so it's really kind of easy for a virus to get put into the phloem channel uh, and then get taken up by the plant, if that makes sense. So, so you're totally right. Um, gene-based resistance aims to basically make the plant um, stimulate maybe like you could say like the right compounds at the right time at the right dosage. Because like you say, uh, if you do it too much or if you get it wrong or if you focus on the wrong compounds or the wrong, yeah, usually, you know, compounds plural, um, then the uh, insect or whatever will be more easy, easily... Um, uh, adapted to that you know uh people were putting uh they're creating plants i think soybeans um that had the cry proteins that we see in like bacillus thuringiensis and and that sort of a thing it will, it will affect like a, a moths what happened was that the diamondback moth um it, it became it selected for that resistance and uh it basically has no problem with those cry proteins now um, and, and that, uh, obviation of the resistance that probably costs like probably millions of dollars to produce. And then like, not only, not only create, but then also, um, uh, distribute and all that stuff. Right. All the logistics, um, you know, it was obviated in like a few years, possibly even 
that selection had already taken place because we use biocontrols and even chemical controls already that that make use of those various like compounds. So I'm 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 um, uh, you know I think it's really important to not get complacent just because you use a biocontrol or you know a botanical chemical or some sort of natural pesticide or whatever it doesn't mean that uh, the laws of evolution or whatever you know you know those selection pressures are still going to have an effect and um, oftentimes with insects it's about not concentrating those traits um, to some degree as a I think one of the things that I learned from you today is that your profession keeps you humble. Like as smart like as you are, so. you can't outsmart these bugs. So it's a, that that would definitely keep a, a intellectual humble. I, I appreciate both the compliment of being intellectual and also the compliment of being humble. <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna tell you right here right now that. Um, Sometimes I can be a little pretentious and a little bit biased, even even with my empirical research. And you're, but you're right. Um, I'll be asserting that something's the case, and somebody will come along. And when I ask for that research, people will be like, "Well, here's the research." Then I go, "Oh, there's the research." Okay, you know, like um, that's why I'm always asking for cited sources and things like that because either I'm going to be right or I'm going to be wrong and I'm going to learn something. And, and yeah. that is a great, that's a great thing to do. I think <laughs> but when, people, when people assert things without that research though, I kind of, you know, I have to like, I have to guess, you know, I have to like assert or assume that they might be right or might be wrong. And um, I don't think that's helpful for, trying to figure out the solutions to things usually. But sometimes we don't have an explanation for certain effects and we don't for um, years. And so um, empiricism isn't everything, but it does help. It does help a lot. <laughs> yeah, and uh, stuff like that, you file it away and then you hear somebody else a year or so down the line and they say the same thing. It's like, okay, there's two. And then maybe yeah. keep hearing it. it's like you know it's like, well other people are seeing this and and with uh, somebody like you you're you're talking to people around the country so you you're getting a lot of input from different places so absolutely am I correct about that that you've got clients like this? you're not just Southern California right that's correct yes um, and even for people who aren't necessarily clients um, that's one reason why it's really important for me to. Uh, contact as many people as possible and be available for those people. Not only because we just got through talking about how and why cannabis uh, is unsupported, essentially, or poorly supported now. Um, so to me, as a person who's part of the community, um, if I can call myself that, um, I think it's really important to support as many people as possible, specifically because of that, but also because I learn stuff too. And then I can disseminate that information to other people, um, especially when we're dealing with like new threats because maybe the, the, um, the treatments don't exist yet or they're very minimal. Uh, even for pests that we already know are very well established, there aren't always great treatments for. So, yeah, I think that's just a, a really important thing to do. And I really appreciate the support that I get from yourself. Sorry, from yourself and from Peter and from the people in the chat. Yeah, chat's awesome. There's, there's a lot of information spread in these chat rooms. You just got to pay attention. Listen to the right people, I guess. So speaking of the chat, uh, Loyal Ty, who's uh, in the nevada area sent that picture which looks like a hairy caterpillar <laughs> oh yeah actually i had somebody send me a similar kind of caterpillar recently on on cannabis and i think it was a um i wasn't able to identify it to species it just was a little bit too ambiguous from the um from the pictures but um I don't think it's a tussock moth, but I think it's some sort of uh, arabid or arabidi. That's just totally speculation. But a lot of um, sort of tiger moths or arabidi have this kind of like have a lot of like hairs, like this is, um, and kind of there's some that have sort of coloration. But but um, 
I can't be sure. And a while ago, um, just going through the questions, Caleb asked, uh, what do you guys think about IPM dash O KNF IMO with pest insect corpses in the initial collection rise to collect local entomopathogens? Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the, one of the ways that people, one of the ways that people, um, or researchers, uh, have kind of tested things like alarm pheromones and, uh, other sort of signaling compounds in insects is uh, in a very sort of horrific and crude way. They'll like literally blend up things like aphids and caterpillars. And I think that's where some of this advice or some of these like concepts um, kind of originate from because people would do this too. But also um, researchers would find this to be the case that like if you spray like blended up aphids or blended up caterpillars or stink bugs or something, um, especially like communal feeding organisms uh, that they would actually react uh, in a negative way. They would, they would evacuate. And so that kind of is like a crude way of being like, well, there must be something there that's doing that. Now we have to find out what the chemical is, what causes it um, and other sorts of factors like that. So maybe that could be useful in some context, but I, I feel like it wouldn't, um, it probably wouldn't be the only thing you could rely on necessarily. And it really is uh, insect specific. Got it. Well, should we, uh, whoop. should we wrap it on that? Uh, sure. I'm yeah, fine with that. No, so I learned a lot today. Uh, thank you so much for coming on here, Matt. That's, that's, I really appreciate it. And uh, so, again, thank you for identifying that that stink bug army for me. That's about, like I said, like I said, my wife is very happy about that. So, uh, again, it's just thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this, and I hope that the audience learned something from it, or at least was I'm, entertained in some way. Well, at the very least, right. I really, appre I really appreciate uh, that Peter allows me to and, and seeks me out to, to have these conversations and, and, and insight. Um, I'm humbled by it, like you were just describing. Um, and I'm just excited to be able to give that information to as many people as possible. And Future Canvas Project has been a great way for that to be a conduit. And um, I look forward to our mutual successes, everyone. I'm trying to think if there's any uh, housekeeping. There's no Chad tomorrow, right, Chad? There may be a James Loud on Sunday. Uh, next Friday, we have Raymond Cloyd. It's going to be stuff before then, but uh, relevant or rele yeah, relevant to this conversation. Uh, and what were we asking him about? The sex lives of aphids? Yeah, the, uh, hold on, let me, let me get it for you guys, because I just want to make sure. Not his own Forget sex what... life, right? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. yeah, I mean, you could ask that question, but I don't think it'd be appropriate. That's, on the live stream. That's it, end of interview. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, I think the paper is like humorously called something to the effect of like, the the kinky sex lives of a certain kind of parasitoid and i'm blanking on it um uh the wasps yeah not aphids yeah no not aphids but um because the wasp will uh the females get tangled up in a spider web and the and then the males come in and then they mate if i'm remembering correctly and so that's how that happens for that species which is kind of interesting um uh, fun fact kinsley who is known for the kinsley scale was an entomologist before he was doing any of that research so maybe there's something to that i don't know all right so <laughs> the kinky sex lives of parasitic wasps yes all right. <laughs> he gave a presentation about it a while ago and i, I really enjoyed it <laughs> It was very, very humorous.
Yeah, I had Leaf Septorum as a uh, note. Uh... Like you were talking about earlier, Matt, that the uh, the uh, mainstreamization, I can't find a good word for it, but the, the cannabis becoming mainstream is how Peter can get these, these awesome professors on like the guy from yeah. Purdue that was on a month, about a month ago. That's uh, that's actually how I found this channel, or, uh, or started participating in it. Somebody told me about a Bob Hemphill video that was on here, so I watched that. And while I was watching that, a live started, and it was a professor. I, I think it was, uh, I don't remember where he was from, but it, it, it was amazing listening to uh, uh, somebody with tenure at a college talking to Peter about cannabis uh, i was just blown away and it's just it's it, it it's very cool that peter provides this platform and can get people like yourself and these uh these professors on there and he even gives me a little bit of time this is a little nobody guy like myself can get on here every <laughs> once in a while so i uh, he he really he uh, i'm kissing a little ass i guess but he really he provides a, a large range of topics on here and not everybody appreciates it he's like oh this isn't about cannabis but uh, yeah a lot of times it is in a roundabout way because a, a plant's a plant's a plant i certainly like to agree with that. uh um oh peter you were uh, muted you were gonna yeah, say no, something so, so uh someone reminded me uh about bonnie bassler uh who's uh, at princeton who does quorum sensing quorum sensing research and uh she just responded to me saying many thanks for the nice invitation i'm going to decline <laughs> i do not work on plants at all so i'm not an appropriate speaker for your audience and uh in my stick to uh i'm gonna let her know <laughs> that we don't really care if she doesn't talk about plants uh it would be an interesting topic oh definitely absolutely uh, yeah, I, um, Peter, you're a, you're a real populist, you know that you're, um, you're really <laughs> helping. I mean, like, I, I don't, I definitely want to echo that last part that Elka says about how um, you bring people on, various people on. And I understand the idea that, like, you want people to speak what they're saying. And if it is bro science or wrong or right, you know, hopefully somebody will come in and it'll start a discussion. And I think that's um, as much, you know, you know me. I love to talk about how empiric, you know, empirical study this, empirical research that, and how I like to couch a lot of my, pretty much all of my uh, observations in that way in my in my um, treatments and things like this. Uh, but it's not everything, and um, you know, some real good information can come from that, and um, it's all about distributing it. And I really appreciate that um, that uh, that drive. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's also like, you know, this woman's reply, and I, I feel like everybody watching doesn't really care if it's not about, if it's like some interesting topic, like that's that's where my mind goes is, you know, when, when I used to, when I was living in New York and I DJed a lot, you know, it's like you, you play some clubs and it was like, kind of had to be all house or you play other places mm -hmm. and it had to be all kind of hip hop and like I'm like I'll do it but I'd much rather just be able to do what I feel like doing which is to like wander all over the place so like topically I don't really feel like doing <laughs> one thing all the time yeah I see the Dr. Christine Jones uh I may have reached out to her too but uh I'm gonna cue that up um so anyway that that's why i don't really care if it's uh <laughs> if it's not plant related yeah, i liked the idea that you mentioned before about uh, uh cannabis culture too like uh, chad westport and the skateboarding and then the surfers and uh, i know you're not <laughs> supposed to talk about the surfers and surfers don't like to talk but if you can get a few surfers to talk that would be amazing especially older ones well, well, I that's funny because I this morning I was uh, gonna get back in touch with Peter McGuire uh, and Mike Ritter uh, to kind of set that in motion, but 
again, it's, uh, I'm like pulled in so many different directions and I'm like, <laughs> I'd like to do that. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> but I can actually uh, make it happen. But I think if you and Chad wanted to, to get a skateboarding conversation going, I don't know if Chad's still in the chat, but, uh, I think that'd be fun. Like, like the, for example, that there was a guy, um, you know, pre COVID I used to do these events actually it was in a space across from Gemma's preschool uh where we just smoke like la hipsters out with good weed and have bands playing and uh and one of the guys who came was he's probably like 21 and he had just moved to la from ohio and he you know he wanted to chase his dream of becoming a professional skateboarder and obviously that's more likely to happen if you're uh, skating in like the Venice skate parks versus uh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'd love to just like smoke this guy out and let him talk. Like, like I want to catch up with him and, and like revisit. Like when we last met, you had just moved to LA to chase your dream. Um, you know, and let's just talk skateboarding and the Venice scene and kind of... Yes, Greg McAllister, people have been asking for you. Yes, please do it, Greg. Please, please, please. Uh, some of us we, we, idolize he, you. He, he, he talks <laughs> retirement, but I think I think Don Huber is retired, and he came on. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like a spring chicken compared to him. I think he's like 90. <laughs> If you're taking uh, suggestions, uh, Whitney Crenshaw um, in Colorado would be an excellent entomologist to um, to ask about. And, he, and, and they're doing specifically uh, a lot of hemp pests and um, uh, really great sources. And I think a lot of cool research about their pest abatement will come from Colorado State or Colorado yeah, State University, I believe, or University of Colorado, one of the two. Maybe he could uh, make a surprise cameo when Raymond Cloyd's uh, rapping. Yeah. Could be a day. Like, I, I did that worm thing, and I think a, a day of entomology. <laughs> that would be great. A day of I worms. Would love, I would love to, a to be a part of that. A day of... Uh, I think I was going to... I queued up an email to a guy who I think... Uh, since Bruce Bugby never responds to me, I was going to reach out to another guy in, in his, uh, at, uh, I think it's Utah State. Yeah, Bugby's how you get Greg on here, man. He wouldn't be able to resist if you got Bugby on. Yeah, Greg, what if, what if you <laughs> interviewed Bruce Bugby? You know you got some questions, old man. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, with that, <laughs> let's uh, let's all get on with our Fridays. All right, uh, I appreciate it, Peter. Uh, what's it like being responsible for three human brains now? It, it's it's like my brain's speed bagged. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Hi, right, Chad That's... is here. Chad's still lurking. Chad, how about a skateboard skateboarding conversation? Because also, like, like, for example, uh, Peter McGuire just wrote a book on the Gracies. Um, and then James Loud is super into MMA. And uh, my friend Kenny Florian uh, is retired, but he was a fighter. So I was like, that'd be a cool conversation. So Chad looks like he's in agreement on the skate or die. All right. That's... I dig it. As I had to occur, uh, you were uh, mentioning earlier that some places just aren't conducive for it. As he grew up in a skate paradise out there out west, I had to wax all my own curbs, man. So <laughs> uh, I, uh, the guys that I skated with were really hardcore about it. And is it really the only reason I stopped is because it, it, the, it, it was a kind of a punk scene. And I got uh, smacked in the back with the skateboard trucked out at a concert once. So I was like, okay. That's, I think that's about enough of the skateboarding for me. So it, it was just, they, it wasn't, a, it, of course it was on purpose, but it was like, it was just a crazy mosh pit thing. The, the teenagers full of adrenaline and uh, testosterone, they, they make bad choices. So 
Uh, so, yeah, I would love to have a, con a skateboarding conversation with Chad, even though I didn't grow up in a skateboarding paradise. We were hardcore. Well, I, I feel it, yeah, it, it's like a lot of things where, like, if you come from skiing in New England, you can kind of ski anything. Whereas, like, if you only grew up in fluffy powder with, you know, mm -hmm. it, like snowed 12 inches last night and it's 50 and sunny today every day, uh, it's like it, it's like the ski version of an indoor plant. Like, uh, I can't really survive in the wild. <laughs> uh, and that's the wife calling about lunch. So, uh, <laughs> All right, I guess that's a wrap. All right. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, Matt. This is the, I'll be talking to you in the future. I'll try not to bug you too much. If I have too many questions about bugs, I'll just uh, uh, pay a consulting fee. How about that? How about it? Well, I like to be as available as possible, but um, yeah. I am open for business too. I understand uh, Chad, that. Ed. Chad flexing his emoji skills. I don't know how he did that. Uh, where is it? I don't know if it came through on this side. Oh, like the buffering emoji? That's very funny. Above the LOL. No, 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 no. Well, yeah, but uh, in in you can't see it here, but in YouTube, it's... Uh, Anyway, never mind. Because this is what we see. <laughs> buffering, buffering, buffering. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's the. Um, I see it on the chat. It's a. It's like the, like when you're yeah, yeah. when you're a uh, video. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> right. funny. So evidently everybody knows how to do that one. <laughs> it's one of the YouTube. Oh yeah, I see videos. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Now I see it in the YouTube specific uh, emojis. You can do a show on emojis, but uh where we only talk with emojis it's 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 like the ringo star movie it would be silence <laughs> just, <laughs> just throw emojis up on screen yeah for a movie with no words caveman is actually kind of funny you they you think about it they have to act everything out so it just makes it different as anyway chad you're always special <laughs> Yeah, the, thanks to the chat room. I appreciate you guys showing up, and it's it's always fun hanging out with you all. That's I can't bring it up on here because that's that I get distracted. I wouldn't. That, it would not. It it wouldn't be good if I was able to look at the chat and do the show at the same time. So and and every time Chad does a show, I'm now gonna queue up my uh, hideley ho chatterinos. Uh... <laughs> oh, I like this. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Chad Posse is Chatterinos. <laughs> nice. All right. All right. With that, should we wrap it? Sounds good. Enjoy your lunch, Pete. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right, man. Have a good one.